press record. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everyone, um, to this ARP session on science, public engagement, and deliberative democracy in Australia and New Zealand. My name is Sujata Raman. Uh, I'm at the Center for the Public Awareness of Science, also known as CPAS at the ANU. Uh, and I want to acknowledge I'm joining you today from the place that is um, known on the world map as uh, Canberra, but is in fact Ngunnawal, Nambri country. Uh, this is land that was, of course, never ceded. Um, now, I made my way uh, fairly recently to this beautiful country from uh, India with some fairly long stopovers in um, two other major seats of, um, uh, two major seats of modern empire, the US uh, and the United Kingdom. Um, so I think for me, um, acknowledgement of country has come to uh, have quite a lot of personal significance in the sense that you know, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm coming to reflect a lot more than uh, ever before uh, about what it means to be doing the work that we do um, in a land and in a world that has been so profoundly changed uh, by colonialism and by settler colonialism uh, in particular. Um, so the topic, uh, I, I think this, uh, these themes uh, very much relate to the, the, the topic for our panel today. Uh, and I think somebody who comes from social studies of science, um, in my corner of STS uh, studies of science and democracy, uh, there is much work to be done uh, on these issues of, uh, of this history of colonial history, its endurance in the present, uh, but also in how we imagine the future. Um, even asking what it means to orient our work around the very notion of democracy. Uh, I think is something that uh, we all have a lot to uh, maybe think about. Uh, I suspect um, same goes for work conducted under the rubric of deliberative uh, democracy. Um, I just wanted to mention uh, the work of uh, Kyle White, some of you may be familiar with. Uh, now, obviously he's writing in the context of another settler colonial society, the US. Uh, and one of the arguments he's made that has quite an uh, impact on me um, uh, was that you know when you uh, think about uh, in in his uh, in his case um, Native American tribes, the very terms on which they are brought into um, deliberative um, kind of activities, uh, notions of sovereignty and so forth, can, just can't be assumed. Um, so I think um, uh, there's much work to be done, uh, and I think this uh, this panel is a very exciting opportunity to start a conversation uh, between scholars who identify with. Um, uh, maybe HPS, STS um, side of things, um, and others who have been working in the field of deliberative democracy. Uh, and my sense is these are fields that have sort of played in each other's ter territory um, in a sense, but maybe haven't really uh, engaged substantively with each other uh, in the way they, they could have. Um, and this panel is a way of maybe correcting um, that absence. Um, there, there has been, of course, the odd skirmish uh, STS scholars on public engagement sometimes have been critical of what they describe as the kind of universal model of deliberation uh, that they, they argue deliberative democracy theorists and practitioners subscribe to. Uh, but I think, you know, scholars who come from the, the world of deliberative democracy thinking uh, probably feel this model is a bit of a straw person. Well, you know, what are you talking about? Things have maybe moved on in our field. Um, so. I want to say it's my privilege to introduce this session, but of course, um, the very idea for the for the session uh, comes from uh, Tatiana, uh, Tatiana um, Buklias uh, from the University of Auckland. Um, so she came up with the idea. She uh, organized it in collaboration with uh, Wendy Russell at the ANU. Uh, and I want to um, really thank uh, Tatiana and also Wendy for coming up with a very thought provoking agenda, I think, um, that we have for today. Um, I don't want to say very much, just very briefly uh, summarize some, some of the themes for today, which you will have seen uh, in your uh, handbook. Um, so as I said, broadly, the aim is to explore the overlap, the synergies, the tensions between um, public engagement around science and technology issues and deliberative democracy. Uh, but it's also to consider uh, where we might go from here. So to build on existing practices, uh, build on intersections that we hope to explore today um, and consider how they apply, particularly in the context of uh, the governance of science and technology uh, in Australia and in New Zealand. Uh, and hopefully from this, we can um, 
build on, develop a, a, a research agenda, but also uh, an action agenda, a practice agenda, uh, connecting back to the theme that we uh, just heard about. Some of you may have been in the, in the panel uh, on social responsibility in science, which is you know, very much um, practice oriented, um, uh, along with um, its more contemporary uh, sibling, if you like, uh, the field of res uh, responsible research and innovation. Um, some of the kinds of questions we want to explore, um, how can we bring questions uh, that are a primary concern in STS and HPS, um, notion of uh, you know, how, how we understand uh, knowledge, what counts as knowledge, um, how do we bring those issues to bear on deliberative democracy uh, debates, um, what kinds of issues are best addressed through deliberative processes, um, how can we, uh, and I think this is a very important question for us um, today, how can we bring the more kind of cultural uh, knowledge and uh, uh, awareness of cultural spe uh, specificity, uh, particularly, as I said at the start, um, notions of uh, and concerns, the need to uh, consider uh, what indigenous science um, is like, how do you uh, engage with indigenous communities uh, in terms of these kinds of agendas. So how do we bring these questions to bear? Uh, on the agenda of um, deliberative uh, democracy, but also the practice design, the design of these processes. Um, some of the other questions, um, again, came up in the previous panel on social responsibility. How can we connect deliberation around very specific cases, um, gene editing or you know, uh, agri-biotechnologies? How can we connect them um, to uh, wider systems, to wider social uh, and economic systems? Uh, so I'm hoping we can um, uh, address those questions um, in, in our discussion. Um, so to kick us off, we have got two uh, great uh, speakers. Um, each of them will speak for about 15 minutes. We'll have five minute uh, discussion Q&A right after each paper, uh, and then there'll be a longer discussion at the end of the session um, after a break. So the first uh, speaker is uh, Wendy Russell. Um, who's going to speak about the political decontextualization of science technology issues and deliberative processes. Um, Wendy, do you, uh, would you like to share your screen? Thanks, Sujatha, I will. And it works this time, yay. Okay, thank you so much, Sujatha. And I would also like to thank Tatiana for um, initiating a session and for working um, for all the work she's put into it. It's been great to work with you again, Tatiana, so thank you. Um, and I am talking today about a topic that comes from, partly from the work that I've been doing with Sujatha in the Centre for Public Awareness um, of Science at ANU, but it's also drawing on some work on um, deliberative democracy um, and deliberative um, democracy impacts that I did um, as an associate of the Centre for Deliberative Democracy. It also draws on observations of um, deliberative processes that I've um, that have come from my practice uh, as a deliberative practitioner, and um, in observing, in particular, so I, I was uh, one of the table facilitators at the genome editing citizens jury, which Simon and Rebecca are going to talk about later, um, and that was a very interesting process. So that's also stimulated this thinking. I've also tried to bring a little bit of my more recent work. Um, as a research fellow with the Battery Storage and Grid Integration Program at ANU. Um, so a lot of things feeding into this. Um, and the focus of the, this thinking um, is around how things are um, put out of context and um, how this is a problem for both deliberative democracy and um, science and technology studies. And so I'm going to talk about um, how deliberative pu many publics are sometimes taken out of context. And I'm going to talk about them as being in a kind of bubble, whereas um, they should ideally be thought about as in a system. And also about how science and technology topics, particularly in deliberative processes, are sometimes also considered in an isolated way. And here I'm, I'm going to consider them as a slice rather than again in a system. And I will draw on genome editing and neighborhood batteries as examples to explain this. Then I'll talk a bit about the implications and connect with some thinking that Sujatha and I have been doing about um, opening out. So, um, 
often I think deliberative mini publics are regarded in this sort of isolated way. Uh, this is part of the critique of SGS scholars sometimes that the deliberative mini public is considered as this sort of ideal kind of setting. And it's a setting where you can bring political or societal problems and get these sort of authoritative representative sort of solutions. And for advocates, you know, these should be taken up with policy because the quality of these processes is higher than, than politics or, or whatever. Um, and I think that SDS critiques sometimes um, impute this vision of, of deliberative mini publics on deliberative Democrats. But I, I think this hasn't been the case for a long time. And particularly for the last year, deliberative Democrats have been thinking about deliberative processes in deliberative systems. And there's quite a lot of scholarship on that. Um, this is actually my own scheme that's come from the work that I did in deliberative impacts. Um, and John, John Dreisach's model has the empowered sphere and the public sphere separate, but I nest the empowered sphere within the public sphere. That's not just my interpretation, but I'm also interested in the idea of this influential orbit, which is a group of kind of actors who have access to policy making and who um, mediate between the empowered sphere and the public sphere. Um, and then also recognising that um, policy um, making is also connected to broader issues of agenda setting and public debate and also policy implementation which extend beyond the empowered sphere um, and that if we consider de deliberative mini publics uh, they have the potential to impact on all parts of this system and one of the arguments I'm trying to make in this work is that deliberative mini publics bring citizen perspectives views and judgments into close to proximity with policy decision making, or ideally they do. And in this sense, deliberative mini publics kind of join in, join this influential orbit. And there they have um, impacts uh, in kind of jostling with the other players in that orbit, and they can kind of reshape debates and so on. So the idea that the um, that success for a deliberative mini public is just influence on policy making directly is a, is a far too narrow and limited way of understanding um, the contributions that deliberative mini publics um, can make um, in these complicated systems. But it also emphasises, and, and Simon, um, working with Simon has kind of emphasised this for me, that deliberative mini publics are an intervention in a wider political system and we need to understand them as such. Uh, so I think, um, as I say, deliberative Democrats have been thinking in this systemic way for quite some time. Um, and. Uh, but what I, what I really find in deliberative democracy is, uh, is um, thinking about technoscience and how it is connected to these kind of wider systems or these processes and some of the insights of, of STS on how um, technoscience and, and society kind of are co-produced. So I think there's a lot of sort of scope for, um, for those broader sort of considerations. Um, but also I'm interested in how, um, how dismissive um, science and technology studies scholars are of deliberative mini publics as a, um, a process for engagement or, or, or participation um, in their systemic kind of views of, um, of sort of ecosystems of participation in relation to technoscience. Um, and I think that um, some of this dismissiveness um, comes from Sort of instrumental uses of deliberative mini publics, uh, particularly in, in places like the UK, where they have been used to kind of shore up science. Uh, but I also think that this dismissiveness comes from um, the way that deliberative mini publics frame science and technology topics. And that's what I want to talk about next. So this is my idea of technology in a slice. And what I'm suggesting is that deliberative processes often, and, and other, other kind of engagement processes generally, um, often consider technologies in a, in a quite a narrow way, in a way that doesn't connect them to wider systems, as um, Siddhartha referred to. And so in the example of genome editing, and I think we saw this in the recent citizens jury, um, we, have, we consider these various kind of issues various types of issues, but again, in this narrow way. So when we think we're, we talk about health and genome editing in relation to health, a lot of the talk focuses on, on saving lives. 
but there's a bit of talk talk about who's whose lives which diseases and so on it's a lot about how this is going to save lives and stop suffering um, and ethically often the conversations focus around specific ethical issues to do with a particular technology such as informed consent privacy and so on and and similarly in the political sphere the um the focus is on direct kind of governance um, and decision making about the particular technology and for example regulations and how they might or might not enable these technologies to make their contributions um, talking about equitable uh, talking about economic issues there is some talk about equitable access but often in quite a narrow kind of way and as if this isn't a big problem we just need to have more public funding and and to give everyone access to it and and that will be fine not regarding broader kind of aspects of of equity and similarly in terms of culture there's some thinking about kind of discrimination that, that genome editing could kind of lead to and some of those specific issues about direct results of that technology but not kind of broader cultural issues um, and in terms of environmental issues we don't usually have much discussion of those um, when it's about a medical technology except perhaps when we've got environmental applications like um, biodiversity conservation for example so then my suggestion is that if we think about these technologies in a broader way as part of a system then these issues look quite different and these conversations open up in quite different kind of ways so for example the um, issues for health of genome editing are actually broad issues about health system priorities uh, and this is prior, not even only priorities between different medical interventions and technologies, for example, but priorities um, between medical intervention and public health um, of, uh, interventions, for example. Uh, and the whole way that we structure our, our health system uh, influences how we take up these technologies and these technologies also influence those priorities in turn. And there are enormous health equity kind of issues which are very complex um, and systemic that these um, topics touch on but, but that aren't kind of opened up by these conversations usually. And similarly ethically the whole issue of the whole ethics of, of saving lives particularly in a broader kind of context of you know a world in some kind of peril from climate change you know massive biodiversity loss and extinction uh, you know that is potentially quite a complex kind of ethical conversation uh, but that doesn't tend to come up and that whole issue of, of techno kind of fixing in this case genetic problems is also a broader ethical um, issue similarly politically we're talking about the governance of innovation more broadly and research priorities what and, and economically what are the opportunity costs if we invest in this particular technology what other things are we not investing in how is that having implications for equity going forward how is it reinforcing existing um, inequity etc uh, and in the cultural sphere i mean there are an enormous number of issues here as well all about you know what we def understand as normality how we regard disability and how we respond to disability how we care for um, for disability and um, for suffering and so on but then also um, other issues <clears throat> particularly um, concerning other cultures um, so for uh, indigenous cultures um, notions of genealogy um, for example uh, would, would see these kinds of interventions in very different kind of ways and, and that's true for other cultures as well uh, and in environmental environmental terms these this these kinds of technologies have influences on our on our relationship with nature nature not only in our intervention for example in, in genetics and so on uh, but also in relation to um, our our priorities uh, in terms of techno fixing uh, and um, in terms of our relationship with other species and i do think that climate change is actually a context for these conversations even though it's rarely kind of raised in a process like this now um how am i going for time i can't actually touch on how am i going for time uh, another seven minutes if you okay. want questions yeah. all right 
Um, so, so very quickly then, I won't go through these in details, but I've also started thinking about neighbourhood batteries, which I'm working on at the moment in a similar kind of way. And this is not referring to a deliberative process, but just in general in the way that we engage, that people are engaging about neighbourhood batteries. We also see technology regarded in this very narrow kind of way. And it's particularly about how we are adjusting the existing energy system, how customers are getting part to, get, to participate in that new arrangement, um, how the regulations enable it or not. Um, and um, a little bit about equity of access. Uh, but if we think about this issue in its broader sort of context, um, it's all about energy system uh, transformation generally, about decarbonisation and how, um, how distributed energy systems could kind of develop to change our relationship with energy use, how it might also change our, um, uh, the governance of energy um, with, with community groups potentially taking more control of their energy production and use. Um, and, and enormous kind of issues around energy equity, which has been a huge issue with, with renewable energy. Um, so the, the implications of these ways of framing these topics then in deliberative processes are that the slice approach tends to be a kind of, well, what do you think of this technology in this little box, in this slice? And the, and the reaction is often, oh, it's nice, it's beaut, you know, what a terrific technology. We, there's a few things that need to be taken care of, but yeah, no, it looks good. Whereas I think that what happens if we take the more systemic approach um, is that what we're asking is, come on, you can do it, no. What we're asking is, is this the technology that we need in the context of where we are at the moment and the problems that we have, not just in this particular area, but more broadly. And the response that tends to come up in, in response to that question is, well, gee, it's hard to say. And I guess this is partly why it's, a pro it's problematic to open up these conversations in this way, because it's very difficult to get um, a successful outcome in the sense of, you know, a cogent set of, of recommendations or a sort of some kind of consensus position. Um, because, you know, it opens up the whole can of worms. And that's partly, I think, it is a difficulty but I actually think it's also an opportunity. And this comes to our thinking about opening up and opening out. And so in STS, um, particularly Andy Sterling has kind of raised this idea and it's been an important theme that engagement around technology should open up these conversations about techno science and open up to different kind of options um, and uh, different kind of commitments. And we see the opening up as really important, but often it's just opening the lid of the black box of technoscience, looking at the technoscience inside, noticing some kind of risks and benefits and some ethical kind of issues, but not actually unsettling the science that's in there um, very much. So what we're proposing is that we should instead think about opening out. And opening out means unpacking the box. Um, and taking all the things that make up the techno science and considering them in their broader sort of context. Um, and in terms of what, what they're telling us about other things that are going on in the broader system. And that um, in doing this opening up, out, um, we get to talk about some of the important issues that we need to talk about, about society, about democracy, about the future. And often, We've, we find that there's not much that we can identify in the box <laughs> around the techno science. That is that the, the boundaries around the techno science kind of um, become very blurry. And we're talking about something much larger, but we actually think those are the kinds of conversations that we probably need to have. And that is a contribution that these kinds of um, processes can make. So I guess the key messages then are that deliberative uh, mini publics don't exist in isolation, they're interventions in wider political systems. And this is um, being understood increasingly um, and studied in that way. Um, and science and technologies don't exist in isolation, they are co-constitutive of wider socio-technical systems. And that needs to be considered when they're being um, deliberated about. Uh, 
And the political and socio-technical systems are, um, as we know from STS, entangled. <clears throat> and these entanglements are messy and they make these processes messy and they create you know, overflow, as other STS scholars have pointed out. But what we're suggesting is that um, this opening out, uh, and that is, that is part of what that overflow is about, um, actually can connect us to important, but difficult, but important democratic conversations. And that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much, Wendy. Uh, do you mind um, stopping your screen share so we can see everyone? Sure. Um, thank you very much. Um, we started about three minutes late, so we've got a couple of minutes for questions. And then, of course, there'll be plenty of time for discussion afterwards. Um, any uh, sort of quick questions for Wendy at this point? Uh, anybody? Um, I think there's plenty there to think about. Um, so, okay, so yeah, we've got a couple. Uh, so, Nicola and then Matthew. Nicola, please. Thanks, thanks uh, Wendy. I hope I'm unmuted. That was really, um, that was a really interesting way of thinking about, um, uh, you know, mini politics and interventions, etc. I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about how you see the difference between opening up and opening out uh, in terms of the, um, you know, in terms of the practicalities, but also the kind of the normative uh, differences. Wendy, can I uh, get the other question and then I'll ask you to respond to them together? Yeah, um, Matthew, do you want to? Yeah, thanks. Hey, Wendy, um, I'm tempted to ask you about STS critiques of delivery of democracy. Uh, because I, I'd love to know what, who, who's making these critiques and where they are, because I'm not quite sure that's, like, I'd love to, I'd love to know what you're thinking about there. Because um, it strikes me that there's, there's conversations, but whether critique's the right word, I, I'm not sure. Um, but the question really is about the, the battery project and whether you'd had opportunity to perhaps have a look at some of the um, literature around material participation. I'm thinking particularly of Notch Amara's and Elizabeth Shove's kind of practice-based work, which which centres devices necessarily rather than formats of publics in a way, and, and, and whether that's perhaps a useful addition to the to the kind of opening out kind of um, agenda. Thanks, thanks, man. Um, yeah, so um, so opening up, up and opening out. Um, I think part of this came from the observation that um, you know we we as practitioners and scholars often maintain these kind of boundaries around um, techno science um, in, in these kind of engagements, that that's what it's about. And it's about this particular techno science. Um, and we open up, you know, in terms of commitments and values and, and futures and so on. But we don't recognise that it's not um, that, that we're constructing that, that, that kind of frame. And for other people, it might not be techno science that they're actually talking about. Um, and, you know, they might be to have other kind of interests and, hello, <laughs> Samuel. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so the opening out is about letting go of those kind of boundaries um, on what it is we're actually talking about, because it might be that we're talking about, um, you know, about privacy or we're talking about, you know, some aspects of governance or, or democracy and the, the technology is kind of just an, an entry into that. Um, but also I think that the, the opening out idea also um, connects with some of Matt's work on um, connecting with other forms of kind of participation and engagement with techno science kind of issues um, and how we can have these process be, be more um, porous, I guess. Um, that's a bit vague, but... Uh, and Wendy, so, can I ask about the, can we come back to the, the uh, Matt's question, provocation maybe about, you know, who are, who are the people who are doing the critiques because um, uh, I want to try and keep to time. Um, sure. But yeah, let's come back yeah. to that. Hold that thought. Uh, thank you very much, Wendy. Uh, we'll have plenty of time to discuss these issues. Um, the next speaker is Rachel Ankeny from the University of Adelaide. And Rachel's going to speak to us about participatory approaches to explore uh, food values. Rachel, over to you. And you have your 
Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I'm sharing, but you're not saying anything, which is a bit um, weird. No, I can see the PowerPoint, but it's sort of, yeah, blank. If you click on the first slide. Yeah, I am. Oh, there it is. Sorry. Oh, there, there it goes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and I want to acknowledge I'm coming to you from Ghana land, which has never been seated. Um, this talk, I want to thank Tatiana and Wendy because it's forced me to kind of think a bit about a whole range of things that I often hold separate. Um, as most of you know, um, we do a fair amount of what I would call social science style food research, um, but it's heavily influenced by deliberative approaches. And so what I've done is tried to think about the research we do, which is primarily research. It's not got goals about policy. It's even probably earlier stage than a lot of stuff that we often do when we're doing truly deliberative approaches um, to think about ways in which we might bring together the best of participatory approaches more generally with deliberative approaches um, and you know what we know from STS. So I think a lot of what we do, we bring these things together, but I'm not sure that I've ever really articulated it. So hopefully I'll be able to do that. And I want to recognize that Rebecca, who's also on the line, uh, Rebecca Paxton is part of several of these projects. So she can come in during the questions. So the Food Values Research Group that um, I work with looks at how food related attitudes are influenced by a whole range of factors. And here I would say we're already starting to break down a lot of the issues that Wendy was talking about, although many of the kinds of topics we often end up looking at involve science and technology. We do try to come in with that broader context and not presume what the question is. Now that's not always successful because it depends too on what partners um, wanna know about, but also about needing to start somewhere. But we're extremely conscious about framing to allow, as you'll see in a minute, um, answers that aren't necessarily what one might expect or even questions to come into the mix. So we do a lot of this, call it broadening. I don't know if it's opening up or opening out or whatever, but it's certainly, bringing in the broader context and letting people structure. Um, and we come at it from many different methods. Um, we work with psychologists, economists, animal scientists, a whole range of things, and we do things kind of out there um, in the field. So um, part of what I've tried to do with this group is to um, counteract typical approaches to food and beverage and, and anything that's consumer domains, um, namely that most data comes from surveys or polls, um, what food companies in particular, but even policymakers care about is, well, will people still buy it? Um, and therefore, key issues are often about consumerism and individual choice, rather than policy, or even more generally thinking about the common good and what we're looking for in a food system in Australia. Um, this is an STS kind of recognition, but food-related issues in particular are often viewed as technical or scientific, and therefore, there's a looking to the experts, and we've tried to really say, um, all of this public views matter, and that's part of why we use the word values. Um, and we need to have debate and dialogue, not just in times of crisis, not just among kind of elites who have time, energy, money to participate, but much more on the ground. And hence, a lot of our research does tend to be representative, not for the sake of being representative, but to be able to hear those voices um, and to break down the individualistic kind of point of view. So why do we focus on food values? I've already hinted at some of it. Um, also because these are generally, I think, stand-ins for all sorts of other debates. Think of climate change, think of a lot of STS kind of debates over particular kinds of technologies, access and health. Um, and so I don't really think it's mostly about food, as you'll see in some of the results. Um, it's certainly not just about food. And second, thinking in terms of values is a sort of pushback against economic values implicitly. Um, and I'm doing up a bit of a paper about that at the moment. Um, values in particular, I think, are important because, as I said, food choices are often standing in for other sorts of things. People will say, I buy local or I buy organic, but what's really interesting is the why and what they actually think those things are. And I think thinking about values frees us from, and, and this gets into the deeper issue that I didn't have time to address in this talk, about the epistemic abstinence debate um, in the theoretical literature around deliberative democracy and more generally. We try to use values as just a very open-ended way in. Um, and this in some sense means people can talk about their views and opinions, but we do 
load it with talk that says, we do realize these things are closely held and deeper for you than just opinion. Um, so I'm not really sure what that says about our approach to what counts as truth or what counts as information, but we try to ride some sort of middle ground of recognizing these can be deeply held and so on without necessarily having people completely pin um, their opinions on something like a, a truth claim or something like that. Um, and we ride this through also thinking about the way an identity, identities are tied up with food choices and also policy decisions. So why is this important? This one hits the diversity kind of mandate for this session, which is I think Australia is a really interesting place to do this kind of work because very different kinds of values and lots of conflicts within them. Um, and you know, this audience probably knows all of this, but particularly because of being highly multicultural, um, very focused on food often, um, having concerns about food safety and geographic isolation, particularly now, all of these things make food a really nice window through which to do this, but you have to be aware of the diversity in the population. So we use a range of methods, as I mentioned, quantitative, including some survey methods, not just asking people what they think, but we're much more interested in why they say it, and we use different kinds of ways of getting at that, even when we do surveys. Obviously, qualitative methods, a whole range of things, uh, including deliberative fora, which probably, strictly speaking, don't necessarily tick the box of the full definition of what counts as deliberative, but uh, draw on a lot of the values, and then also um, mixed methods, so combining these things. So a couple sample projects. One is um, what was called what, what Shall We Have for Tea? trying to look at Australians' um, understandings of values associated with food ethics in particular, and trying to get at what language we might use and what are the underlying concepts. Um, and this one was um, particularly focused on um, using social science methods to get at those concepts. Getting to the meat of the matter was a partnership through a linkage grant from the ARC, trying to look at awareness, knowledge, and understandings of red meat animal welfare, um, using a whole range of those kind of qualitative critiques, um, approaches in particular. More recently, we've done work on hen welfare. Um, Rebecca was involved in this. Um, and here we used a nationally representative survey book ended with qualitative focus groups and thinking about trade-offs between hen welfare, producer health, and environmental sustainability, particularly where scientific evidence is not conclusive or lacking. And so that's a place where I think, you know, I'm sorry, Wendy, I'm not sure which is which, but we're opening for certain and broadening um, because the science is just not at all clear. And we're very clear about that in this particular project. And again, looking at what people mean and why they might care about hen welfare or not care. Um, most recently then we've done a project for the MLA looking at livestock gene editing, which seems like, you know, it's gonna be narrowly technological, but because we use social science methods and we were forced online because of COVID, which was a blessing in disguise, we were able to look at more generally values and acceptability of different applications. And I'm gonna go into this in more detail because I think this does show kind of this marriage of different ideas and techniques. So some of the key themes that came out of this one, um, for example, were this idea that the natural should be preserved. And we looked at both producers and representative community. And there is nervousness about going too far with things like gene editing. Um, I guess I went in with a bit of a hypothesis that if you could gene edit cattle so that they didn't have horns, so that you didn't have to mechanically remove them after birth, people were going to think that probably was not, was a pretty good thing. But they were very, very conflicted. So that's called polled, right? And they were concerned about things like changing temperament and appearance, even if it might help um, for animal welfare reasons. So like having thinner fur in hot areas. The other thing that they did very frequently is kind of challenge the framing and the questions. And our research techniques allowed them to do this. So we had a case study about producing cows with more muscle using gene editing, which would allow fewer animals to produce the same amount of meat. And people were just simply skeptical. They said, well, maybe the science would do that, but what about everything else? Will people actually use this in the right way? Will it result in positive environmental effects? You know, won't this mean that people will just grow the same amount of animals and produce more meat? Um, and um, that they really brought back in sort of the human motivations and the broader context, um, and in some sense rejected the framing. And more generally, they rejected the framing altogether. And so 
repeatedly, particularly when we engaged them in discussion, they said they were concerned not about the science, but about who would benefit, who will be harmed, how it'll be regulated, controlling profit motives, the role of big food and big ag in profit, preserving what they see as traditional ag practices, and that other values such as environmental health or animal welfare will be sacrificed. Another key theme, and sometimes coming from the same people, were, well, is the, is the system even broken? You know, what is the problem here? And then on the other side, a fair number of people saying, oh, there's a problem. I'm really not happy with current agriculture and the way it works, but we need to fix the whole system. This isn't something you can fix technologically by gene editing. Um, you need an overhaul of the whole thing. And this extended to people who obviously were vegans and vegetarians opposed to um, meat farming, for example but also even to people who were carnivores, who were concerned that the overall system is in some sense broken. So just some brief sort of observations coming out of this whole range of projects. How do we know when it works? What are our goals when we use these hybrid approaches? Um, we do look at um, whether people change their views, but most importantly, why? Not because we want a particular answer, but because we wanna see how people engage um, and how this kind of process can help them think through everything. We very clearly, again and again, say, we're not actually seeking to convert anyone, even if there are sponsors to the project. We only uh, work with people, with groups, industry groups that are willing to take a range of answers. Um, we also are not trying actually to impart scientific knowledge, though it's important that they have some um, information, and so we mix it. Our goals are to help them see the complexity, start to develop vocabularies and strategies for discussions with others. Um, we almost always ask, did you go home in between the days, often, and talk to others about the issues? And we think that is a measure of success if they're continuing to think about these issues. If they start to push back, that's a measure of success, um, in the sense that we think that if they're willing to not think that it's always up to the technical experts, and they see what their role is. Um, and finally, just a little anecdote that, you know, participants said everybody should participate in this sort of thing because it really made me think more generally about my role in the food system. That was from the gene editing. So I would argue in brief that I think thinking about food in the future here, at least in Australia, really will require forms of deliberative dialogue. I'm not necessarily spreaking the need for fully deliberative processes always and everywhere. Um, there's all sorts of problems with that, as the Canberra uh, group will tell you. Um, it's costly, it's time consuming, uh, it's difficult to structure. But I think there's all sorts of values that come from the deliberative literature, but also from some of the public understanding of science literature and from STS that could combine together to foster both research and engagement that allow us to help people engage in these sorts of debates. I think people need to develop their tools, but they also need practice at doing these things. And there are ways of doing that that don't involve, you know, full-flung, multi-day deliberative events. It's very critical to talk about things like trade-offs and risks and benefits, um, which are often much more important to people than um, the technical details, and also broadening definitions of what counts as a risk and what counts as a benefit. What we try and do is find underlying shared values. Um, that's not always easy. It's not always the case. But trying to think about where to from here as well as acknowledging that the system may well be broken in many cases. Finally, I guess the, the easy sort of punchline that I usually use is that what we're trying to do is shift people from envisioning themselves as consumers making personal choices to actually also and simultaneously being food citizens, people who need to think about these broader issues, especially because of the critical nature of food um, as part of a, of a socially and economically just um, society. And so just a few acknowledgements, ARC's funded quite a bit of this. We've got lots of um, partners who've been really open to flushing out issues, even if it's not necessarily going to make them look good. Um, and lots of collaborators, um, including, as I noted, Rebecca, who's online, and Heather Bray and Kelly McKinley, who several of you know. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rachel. Um, do you mind share? Oh, there you go. Uh, so again, we started slightly late, so if people don't mind, we'll go on till about uh, 11.23. Um, uh, questions for Rachel. We've got a couple of minutes and Wendy, I might bring you back at the end. Um, questions? Uh, 
I don't want to abuse my chair privilege, but I will if I need to. Um, so Rachel, can you say, so I thought that was fascinating, like looking at the two talks also in a uh, combination. Um, when you talked about, uh, you know, food is not just food, it's actually connected to other things. Um, and even if you look at food, it's, you know, part of this wider system. And, you know, the goal of this work is actually to, um, if you like, uh, open up, open out, whatever, you know, that, that system. Um, so I wonder if you can say a bit more about how you do that, because one of the ways in which in STS we often think about this is, you know, okay, we're looking only at this one technology and therefore we should broaden out. And, you know, uh, yeah, Wendy and I have kind of written about this as well, but, you know, we need to look, broaden out and those questions kind of drop out. Um, and yet, I think in your talk, you're saying you can start with something that, you know, on paper looks quite specific, but um, you were then able to do this kind of broadening. So I don't know if you want to speak yeah, to that. Um, so what readily comes to mind, sort of uh, the AIX project, which wasn't that long ago, Hen Welfare Project. Um, explicitly, we started with considering what we knew from literature and from other research we'd done in this domain, the other sorts of trade-offs that when people think about, for example, um, hen welfare, they think about the economic cost, but they also think about things like the environment. They don't often, but we think it's important, think about workers and the way in which different welfare um, regimes um, might implicate uh, worker health. Um, and that's often really neglected in general in sort of food and ag literatures. So we start by making that one of the things that they think about. Um, and I think, and I, I assume Simon and Rebecca are going to talk a bit about Q sorts and other things even if we don't use formal cue sorts, we get them to think about value trade-offs very, very early on. The second thing is we do um, allow people to take the discussions where they will, um, and even when they're wrong in inverted commas, they might bring in things that are, you know, maybe strictly speaking, just off the wall. But I think it often tells us what people are nervous about. Um, and this allows us through really careful facilitation to draw out what some of those other things are. So, you know, as a, as a truism, we know everybody's worried about risk in general, right? This is just kind of part of modern society. But they're also worried about things like individuality. So we see a lot of that in the context of the hen literature. Um, they're worried about themselves and their individuality, and so they project this onto the hens. So Rebecca and I actually put a, you know, a proven, um, a tested and, and trialed anthropomorphism scale that they used in some way we didn't care that much about the results but it triggered them to think in those terms at some point um, so that in our discussions we could bring in topics relating to their relationships with their pets how that influences their attitudes towards farm animal welfare um, their own view of self in relation to non-human animals um, and we try to do this using scenarios photos little um, you know, like these little scales that have been used for other purposes in psychology or social sciences, but that get people thinking in these broader contexts. So that's just a few Thank examples. You. Um, Wendy, I might give you the last word. We have a minute left to uh, go. Do you want to jump in? Sure. Just, just a couple of comments, um, Rachel. I, I really enjoy that. Thanks so much. Thanks. Um, and I think that there's a theme there um, around capacity building. That's, re that's really interesting. And... Um, and we are really interested in that in relation to our deliberation in schools project, um, work and, and the kind of transformational dimensions of deliberation as well. But I also just wanted to say that the whole shift from consumers to citizens is also something we're really working on in the energy sphere. And yeah. um, I think we might talk about that a bit more later because that connects with the material participation that we talked about with, with Matt. But also noting Sarah's comment, um, we're also looking a little bit at gender and energy kind of practices and there's just some really interesting stuff there which yeah. and often there isn't much cross fertilization between yeah. like energy food but it would be great um if there were yeah. yeah and that's another one where there isn't you know we usually smuggle that in under environmental um particularly because it debates over methane and effects of uh, cattle but um mm -hmm. as far as gender let me just say one little plug which is the online groups really allowed us to break down some of the um the usual gender dynamics of focus groups. So just by the by, and, and we'd be happy to talk about that later. Um, big advocate of trying to get people 
you know, in better habits. And I think, you know, just, just as a truism, you know, culturally debating and arguing is valued because we're an Anglo culture for the most part and our politics works that way. And so love the idea of starting early and often in schools to try to develop different kinds of habits of um, civic engagement. On that note, uh, I'm going to draw this part of the session to a close. Uh, plenty of issues, I think, raised that we can think about, reflect on, come back after a cup of tea to hear the, the next round of speakers. Um, uh, Tatiana, are we still okay to start at 1130 um, we, we get yeah, I think minutes. I think we, you know, we scheduled five minute break, and I think it's probably a good idea for <laughs> such a long. Yeah, eleven thirty is that okay? We'll start yeah. at eleven thirty, and we'll still have a lot of time in the discussion. Like, okay, thank you, you. So. and see you all soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, Roberta. So I'm Dr. Kobe Calix with the University of New South Wales, but I'm gonna and I'm facilitating this next hour. I'm gonna hand over to our first two presenters which is Rebecca and Simon who are co-presenting and I'm hoping you're happy to introduce yourselves as part of that, um, if that's gonna work. Sure. And I think Rebecca's gonna take over the screen. Get I'm going to try oh. to take over the screen. Yeah. <laughs> How about, is that working? Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Um, we are seeing what you're seeing. <laughs> yes. Um, all right, uh, so, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tatiana and Wendy, for organizing the session and to Kobe for, for hosting. Um, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a newbie in, in both the deliberative space and the science and technology studies space, so I, I guess I should introduce myself. I, I'm Rebecca. I am a research associate on the project that Wendy mentioned earlier on uh, formulating an Australian community response to um, gene editing which is an MRFF funded project, which is led by uh, Professor Diane Nicol at the uh, University of Tasmania, um, in collaboration with uh, Professor John Dreisack, Nicole Curato and Simon here, who's um, also partnering on this um, presentation out of the Center for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance um, at the University of Canberra. And for the first time ever in my life, I get to acknowledge the custodial uh, traditional custodians of the land on which I am sitting today, which is just outside of Canberra and Nunwal and Nambri land. It's the first time I've got to do that at the conference and I'm very excited about it. <laughs> so I think I might hand over to Simon before the excitement takes me over completely. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, yeah, th thanks, Kobe. Uh, and uh, thanks, Tatiana and, and Wendy for organising uh, this session. Um, just to introduce myself, uh, yeah, first I'm Simon Niemeyer. Um, the, uh, I, I guess I'm, I would introduce myself as the director for the Centre for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance uh, here at the University of Canberra. Um, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm very much a sort of multidisciplinarian, uh, somehow I've ended up uh, being sort of titled a, uh, a deliberative theorist or democratic theorist, um, but I also have a, have a background in uh, economics, ecology, geology, uh, and uh, so for me, it's actually been very much a sort of a, a sort of a needs-based sort of uh, evolution in terms of my uh, my uh, interest in uh, research and and, and scholarship. Um, um, so it's it's really good to um, to be able to engage with a uh, an audience like this uh, in terms of the uh, the work that we're doing. Um, and in, in course, uh, in, in relation to this particular project. Um, uh, which brings sort of the topic of genome editing and deliberation together. It's, it's uh, particularly relevant. And in this presentation, um, we're focused on um, the experience that we've just had in, in terms of running a, a national uh, level process, uh, deliberative process uh, focused on genome editing, um, which will link to a much larger global uh, uh, project, uh, the Global Citizens Assembly, um, which actually, um, uh, connects the national process to the global one, which we'll expand on in a moment. And we have learned a heck of a lot on, on, on uh, in relation to designing uh, a deliberative process with implications for the global one. So we'll use that experience as a sort of lens to tease out uh, what happened here um, with, with the, sort of the implications for design, but also the use of these sorts of processes and maybe, and hopefully address some of um, Wendy's questions that she raises in, in, in relation to what these things do uh, and where they sit in terms of a deliberative system. Um, 
So we'll, give, we'll provide an overview of the project uh, in, in a moment. Um, I, so, so, so Rebecca's actually uh, running the show here and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to the slides. So we, we need to work at a sort of secret um, hand signal to, uh, to switch between them. Uh, so we'll provide some reflections on the process, uh, the scope and the content uh, and lessons for the Global Citizens Assembly. Um, but just as an overview, we did learn a lot. Um, and the preamble to this um, is that this is a, a complex issue with profound implications, um, potentially. Uh, one of the challenges, uh, not just in terms of policy, but in the designing a delivery process, is that there is not really a kind of a dedicated public conversation or, or sort of a substantive public com com conversation in relation to this issue to sort of piggyback on in terms of um, developing a delivery process. So one of the challenges we have is to actually almost generate a, in small scale, a public discussion uh, uh, on, on this issue. We, we call this an anticipatory uh, deliberative process um, that actually is a, a kind of a head of the, of the public sphere in that sense. Uh, and what we want to do is actually connect that you know, to the global process as well. But this, this brought with it a heck of a lot of different design challenges. And one thing I, I would say in terms of design is that there is no one design uh, in terms of uh, a deliberative process for uh, even for a given topic, it partly depends on what the objective is here. And the objective of this process, there, there are multi objectives uh, and we can actually elaborate on those later, but a really important one is to generate that conversation to actually to, to, gen, to develop, you know, a, a sense of what this means, um, what we might call in, in the field meaning making um, rather than decision making, which is what uh, Wendy was, was critiquing. We actually have been aiming to plug this into decision making, but the focus is very much of what this all means and interpreting it in that sense. So we're, we're orienting our reports not around option A, B and C, but in terms of where this goes in terms of how our understanding of these issues sort of translate through a process like that and how we interpret that. So a lot of our research associated with that uh, it goes, but it was looked through that lens. Okay, uh, th thanks Rebecca. So an overview of, of, the, um, of the project, um, we're going to speak to the, uh, the uh, Australian Citizens Jury on Genome Editing mainly, um, but there's actually a really important pre-process um, that we engaged in that actually informed you know, what, what's, what, where we stood currently in terms of meaning uh, within the community and how we actually uh, uh, use that to inform our design and our recruitment strategy um for the uh, the citizens jury itself so we, we will speak to that um during this presentation um uh and actually maybe the next uh, iteration thanks um but the focus on this of course uh, this presentation is actually the connections and the lessons um from uh, the the, na the national process for the global citizen assembly um and you can see from this diagram that the australian citizens jury is one of many with uh, processes that will actually ultimately connect to the Global Citizen Assembly in terms of the content that's produced, um, but also participants will be recruited participants from the various national processes uh, to the Global One. And if we get a bit of time, we can speak to that. Unfortunately, I can't see the timing here, so I don't know how long I'm going. So maybe Rebecca, if you give me sort of a, or, or, or someone, I have, I, have, I have a terrible habit of going over, over time. So we'll, we'll get moving along. But the really, one thing I, I wanted to emphasize here is that um, and this is sort of, I put this in, in response to uh, what Wendy was speaking about. We, we, the whole idea behind this research is focused primarily on connecting this somehow to the wider public. And one mechanism that this is, uh, this is going to be achieved is via a documentary. It was actually a documentary filmmaker that had pitched this idea to us in the first place. And we've just managed to complicate a very basic idea um, uh, ever since. Um, and, and the idea is, is there'll be a science documentary on genome editing, um, part three of which will be focused on the, the deliberative um, component of the Global Citizen Assembly, which will then be sort of communicated to, to the rest of the community. And part of our research is actually going to be looking at how effective this is in terms of uh, you're sort of replicating to some extent um, that, you know, that experience of, of, of deliberation. Um, and feel free to chime in, Rebecca, if I missed something here. Um, no, that's right. Let's uh, let's move on. Yeah. So I'm going to um, take over here for a little bit uh, and talk about some of the lessons that we learned and some of the experiences that we had during the Australian Citizens Jury that are 
very relevant for um, beginning to design the Global Citizens Assembly, and we are in the very sort of early stages of developing that um, design at the moment. One of the things that worked really well for us uh, in the Australian Citizens Jury, jury was um, the recruitment process that we put in place, which was um, based on using Q methodology that Rachel mentioned earlier and that we can talk about a bit more <laughs> later if, if people are interested. Um, which we used to establish a kind of a map of the different discourses that exist on genome editing um, in Australia today. And then we recruited uh, participants to reflect the diversity of those discourses using what um, John Dreisick and Simon have, have developed and called um, discursive representation. So this is actually the first time that discursive representation has been implemented systematically, um, meaning that we uh, recruited participants using a random stratification based on the quotas allocated to these different discourses. And you can see here the map of the discourses, the four discourses that we identified in the mapping process and where the different uh, participants in the citizens jury sort of landed on this map. And you can see we managed to get a pretty good diversity despite the, um, the limitations that COVID kind of threw at us at the time. Um, alongside this, we were also considered considering demographic and sort of um, geographic representation as well. So it wasn't just based on the, the um, discursive representation. And this is something that we're keen to kind of bring in to the Global Citizens Assembly too, but in an expanded version because not all of our um, partners who are running national processes are also um, doing this discursive mapping and we can't assume that the discourses that we've identified are also you know, representative of the discourses that are um, taking place elsewhere. So in the Global Citizens Assembly, um, the uh, process for recruitment is a bit more complicated. Uh, we obviously need to take into account demographic um, factors, and so we're using a standard statistical representation um, through random sampling, uh, stratified random sampling. But, and we're also obviously using the discursive representation, but we're also considering a, who is likely to be affected by this quite soon. Um, so we need to consider where there's going to be, um, where gene editing might be applied uh, relatively soon and in which ways. And we're also um, bringing in what we're calling a developmental um, recruitment, which is based on sort of prior participation in these kinds of processes, either in the national processes or in um, similar um, deliberative processes so that they're familiar both with the process and to a certain extent with the um, with the technology as well. Something that worked a little bit less well was the distribution of time within the process, um, especially between the information giving part where or receiving for the participants um, and the deliberative um, stages. And so we had two fairly intense information sessions on day two and day three where the participants heard from seven subject matter experts who each gave 15 minute presentations followed by small group deliberations and then 15 to 20 minutes of q a and then we had two shorter uh, deliberative um, sessions on day um, three and day four where the participants uh, came up with recommendations from scratch for um, both um, heritable and non-heritable human genome editing, uh, research using um, human embryos, gene editing research using human embryos, and mitochondrial donation. And it was obvious that we didn't have enough time to, to deliberate thoroughly on these issues. Uh, both we and the participants kind of left feeling like um, the process wasn't completely complete. And so to make up for that, we had to run a separate online forum where we were able to sort of discuss the, the topics and the, the recommendations again more fully. Um, in the, uh, part of the reason why the um, developmental um, sort of variable is included in the, the recruitment for this Global Citizens Assembly uh, is that it allows us to bring people in who have already primed on this topic. And so in addition to having a longer process, the Global Citizens Assembly will run over seven days, they will also be familiar and therefore, you know, we are able to hit the ground running a little bit and not have to provide quite as much of an intensive uh, information 
uh, session um, during the, the actual event itself. Uh, Simon, do you want to say a little bit more about any of the, the sort of uh, the ways that this is being managed for the Global CA? Um, uh, yes, I, I mean, just very briefly. Um, I mean, first of all, um, you know, these issues weren't unanticipated. We, we, we knew we were dealing with tensions. We've sort of beaten ourselves up a bit uh, over this, but given the uh, competing complexities we dealt with, uh, actually it, it ended up being a pretty good process, not least because we had a fabulous set of witnesses that were there, um, with the nod to Rachel uh, being one of those uh, the present for the process. Um, but there was a gap uh, in, in terms of the presentation and, and a problem with the distribution of time. We knew this, um, we, we tried to manage it, and uh, clearly there, it, you know, it fell short. Um, so we, we, we're drawing from those lessons. Uh, as we said, it's longer, um, and um, we, we were actually also uh, developing some pre-process processes to even sort of um, beef up the familiarity with the different perspectives that are coming to, to the process, the, the global process. So leave it there. Thanks, Rebecca. Okay, so I'm going to very quickly go through um, this lesson learned that we had. Um, so the, the scope of the, the task the citizens jurors had um, to work with was also quite broad, given the sense that we, uh, the fact that we were only looking at human genome editing. So we asked them to deliberate on the question, under what conditions or circumstances might the application of human genome editing technology be acceptable? And we're actually pretty happy with um, this remit, even though it, it, it is a big question. Uh, it allows the participants to um, to say under no con um, conditions or circumstances um, is it acceptable, for example. So um, this is something that we're also going to be taking with us to the Global Citizens Assembly, which actually has a, a broader remit because it will also be looking at plants and humans. But some of these processes that I mentioned and Simon mentioned um, are designed to give us more time to deliberate and therefore to make this remit a little bit more manageable. Uh, I'm going to skip to the next one just um, for the benefit of time here. Uh, so Simon mentioned that there was a bit of gap in the information that was provided. Sorry, I am going to go a little bit over time. Uh, and uh, this was actually a really important um, sort of takeaway for us. It raised the question of what is the role of experts in this process. So even though um, people, the participants were very happy with the information that they received, they felt like they had enough information to make um, decisions. They felt they were informed about the topic. They felt that there was a lack of balance between the different viewpoints that were presented. And um, I, what seems to have been happening, in, uh, from what we can understand, is that they were expecting there to be a certain amount of advocacy, advocacy provided by the experts, whereas we were thinking of the experts more as providing technical, factual information. Uh, and to a certain extent, that they wanted to hear advocacy, both for and against this topic. And this is something that we're going to have to think about more for the Global Citizens Assembly. How do we manage those expectations? And part of the way that we will be doing that is by actually asking them who they want to hear from and trying to um, allow them to nominate types of experts, if not actual experts themselves. Um, Simon, I think you had one more comment on that and then we can wrap up. Uh, that's fine, thanks. Given that you've done both a great job of mentioning the importance of time. <laughs> Thanks, Rebecca and Simon. That was really thought-provoking. I'm wondering whether there are questions we want to have now. Yes, Maybe I'm just, just wondering, um, so we have another session where Simon and Rebecca are scheduled, but they don't have a presentation. So I'm wondering if we might put the discussion, including questions, off until then, unless someone's got a burning kind of clarification question. Oh, I think oh. we've agreed. Sorry, or, or for later, um, because just after mine, we also have 20 minutes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you can contain your questions for another 15 or 20, depending on, you might give Tatiana the option to go over time if she wants to. Um, uh, I'll try not. <laughs> um, yeah, so next up we have Tatiana, and then we've got 20 minutes for questions that I can facilitate. So thank you, Simon and Rebecca. And I'm passing over to Tatiana now with the screen, hopefully, if we can get, if you've got slides to share. Yeah. Um, do I do this as well? Yeah, that looks good.
Yeah, okay, I think it's this is a bit. Right, um, so tenakoto 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 katoa, nami hinui kiakoto katoa. We don't normally do acknowledgement of the land. What we do in Aotearoa, New Zealand, we greet in Maori and sometimes we introduce ourselves in Maori. So this was just um, introduction. I um, just by way of introduction, and we said we are going to introduce ourselves. I am a. Some people on the call know me as actually as a historian of biomedical science and historians whose research has been gradually moving forward in time to the point where I actually am more of started to actually come to more of social science studies of science uh, conferences. And it's really only in the last uh, really really two years that I've uh, become interested in. Is it something for me? Uh, oh. You're good. <laughs> Sorry, I, I just thought it's something wrong with the slides. Um, so I've become really interested in the work in and around deliberative democracy, an interest which really came out of my own personal political involvement in participatory processes that I found very unsatisfactory and inequitable. And then also, you know, the sort of my personal uh, background, uh, professional background in the history of science, and as I said, increasingly SDS. So while I'm fairly experienced as a historian, I'm quite new to this field, and I'm really grateful for a uh, warm welcome that I've had so far from people who have been active. And um, Simon, who uh, they generously came to uh, my first attempt to organize a conference in the field, and, and, and Wendy, whom I also met there in February last year. So it's, it's wonderful that everybody was enthusiastic about this workshop. So anyway, so I just want to sort of really start uh, with, uh, you know, how it all started, that um, the background of this project was that in early 2020, well, actually in 2019, my colleagues from um, the center where I work half of the time, and I got the funding on the project, which basically the question was, can deliberative democracy enhance with the knowledge from the field, such as indigenous studies, and in New Zealand's case, uh, Matauranga Maori, STS, uh, education, social psychology, and other fields, offer a constructive way for the Aotearoa New Zealand public to engage with complex issues. It's a big promise. As you know, you have to make them to get funding. Um, and, uh, the, so the, and we were really, we all came, colleagues in my team, they come from science studies, history of science, they come also from science policy and science communication. So we, we had a particular interest in questions that came around sort of science. Uh, this, so these kinds of complex issues were around novel technologies and those that it required integrating knowledge ac across multiple scientific disciplines. And for a little while, we actually thought that we would just come up with um, kind of our own question in a sort of anticipatory ma manner that um, sort of Simon said. But um, just an opportunity arise, arose to work with Auckland's water utility company Watercare to design, coordinate, and facilitate a mini public that will ask a question of Watercare's uh, interest, which was how should we ensure that Auckland has sufficient water supply post 2040, or really uh, kind of in a, in a sort of expanded um, uh, uh, form in the face of the combined pressures of climate change and population growth, which new source or sources of water should complement Auckland's existing water supply to ensure that the city post 2040 has sufficient water. So really in this talk, I actually want to talk a little bit about what we call the deliberative workshops. And um, I want to particularly actually spend some time on the, the sort of the context and a sort of the ecology of this question. And then also sort of go into some of the questions that have already been uh, raised here around framing of the questions, response of the public. And it's really sort of for me to actually work through some of the questions that I've encountered, some of the sort of approaches and challenges in SDS literature around how should we think about these intersections between you know, democracy and participation and these kinds of uh, issues. So the question of water. Um, so the question of Auckland's water futures under the combined pressures uh, was really interesting for us, not only because you know, it fit the R criteria that it's a, a complex um, sort of science and technology related uh, question with differing risk perception, because it's, it's also a question of huge 
political and social significance to New Zealand. Uh, first, as a consequence of the dairy farming boom since the 1990s, there's been a quite um, major uh, decline in the freshwater quality. And we can talk about that more. The second is that water governance in New Zealand is in the hands of local authorities. And while some, especially larger local authorities, have the expertise and resources to maintain the water infrastructure and, su and supply, uh, smaller local authorities struggled. And uh, imp important thing that local government uh, legislation embeds forms of citizen engagement, but these forms, these participatory forms are uh, inequitable and they have been easily manipulated by those with larger power. So in particular in rural areas with so this would be large dairy farmers. And then recent research showed that even where there were explicit attempts at collaborative governance of water, they were not seen as genuine and many, and in particular Maori, for whom the water you know, has traditionally had a particular importance and has been seen as a living body, and I'll get to that in a moment, did not trust them. So all of this, um, and three, in the same period, what also saw the growing incorporation of the indigenous and Maori ways of understanding and relating to water. And so famously in 2017, the New Zealand Parliament passed Te Awa Tupua of Whanganui River Claims Settlement Bill, which settled the rights of the Whanganui Iwi or tribe to the river and uh, river in the North Island of New Zealand. And in the process recognized the river as the legal person. So this has been internationally really famous, but what is actually likely to have more significance and which is actually currently also uh, a kind of a cause of a major political debate is that in 2020 a new uh, policy was introduced, a new national policy statement for the freshwater management, which starts with the concept of te mana or te wai, which refers to the essential importance and power or mana of the water wai, and what wai has also other meanings. And then four, we have the question of, sorry, I don't think I put it here, sorry, te mana, te wai, you can see um, here from the Dairy New Zealand um, page, sort of uh, appointing the farmers to um, actually sort of to this new policy. And climate change, where they change rainfall patterns, longer droughts, and more severe floods are further exacerbated the existing problem. Now, so the combined pressures of declining water quality, poor infrastructure, and adequate governance came to head in 2016 uh, outbreak of Campylobacter difficile. Uh, waterborne uh, disease where uh, about a third of the 40,000 of residents of this um, uh, town in east, um, uh, uh, east coast of North Island uh, ended up being ill and um, 45 were hospitalized and so forth. And then subsequent inquiry that followed concluded that existing governance failed in recommending replacing local authorities with independent regulators. And so this is where we are in terms of water. We're in the middle of a big water governance reform implemented from um, uh, the central government and uh, with a kind of big discussions around the push for cent centralization versus local governments and local input. It is really important that the minister who is uh, implementing this reform is a Ma a Ma not only a Maori minister, but a visibly um, sort of belonging to the Maori political body. Uh, uh, Minister Nanaya Mahutan, you can, she has a, a Moko Kawai, the um, uh, facial um, tattoo. And, uh, and all of this is happening at a time when Auckland is going through water restrictions and uh, the, 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 the lowest rainfall in um, several decades. So this is sort of where we were. And the idea of water care was to bring citizens into the long-term planning of the future water sources for Auckland, New Zealand's largest city in a way that's well informed and meaningful, but also in a way that um, will kind of help water care kind of, sort of build relationship for future changes and we can talk about it. And so the, the sort of proposal was to ask participants to identify top four options out of a, a number of options that they identified and that take the base uh, with respect to environmental impact, cost, technical, um, 
aspects such as resilience, response, and demand. But then we soon realized that neither us nor Watercare were actually ready to plunge into a costly and several day long mini public that would really have the full authority in, in a way that, you know, kind of classical um, deliberative democracy uh, literature kind of demands. And so we decided to hold four short deliberative workshops in four different parts of Auckland. And the idea was that we will take seriously the calls to be kind of more reflective, more experimental, and to test some things like who are the public? What, how do they interpret the sort of the, the water moment? <laughs> and what is the impact of the organizational ownership? And what is the, you know, kind of how do these, uh, the broader context of the, you know, the water discussions and other discussions in Auckland sort of come together before we actually go for the full process, which is still scheduled for next year. So I'll briefly talk about some of our findings, but before that, I just want to sort of just say what it looked like. So there were three, four hour, uh, sort of four or three hour workshops at different university locations. And I have to say that having them in university locations seemed to be quite important. As then we heard from participants that the fact that it sort of gave authority and sort of removed from this what they saw as sort of um, maybe um, government's um, push in a way because water care uh, is seen as part of local government and in a way it is. Uh, participants uh, were invited from the customer database uh, via email and we got about sort of the standard response of three to five percent of people not huge numbers, uh, and the people would roughly really, uh, in terms of their demographic um, uh, composition, uh, were uh, quite reasonably close to Auckland census um, data from 2018, with the ex exception that they were more educated than that, uh, and I think that's quite common. And just to say that the program, um, involved in an exploratory part where we asked people about their interest and experience in community engagement, about the personal experience of water restriction in the summer of 2020-2021, and their personal views regarding the extent to which water is a pressing issue in Auckland. And then a learning part where these four options were um, presented by a university um, expert, as one of my colleagues from the team, and then views and understandings of these four potential future water sources were explored and then discussions. And the four sources were uh, looked through sort of these four lenses of technical sort of resilience and demand, environmental responsibility, social acceptability, and cost effectiveness. And these were the four um, options, recycled water, they're not used in New Zealand at the moment, desalination and sort of reducing demand. Now, I just want to sort of spend this next sort of my last few minutes thinking just to sort of just sort of going through a few of our findings and as I'm, I'm actually really analyzing data at the moment so this is all very exploratory for me and one thing that was really very obvious that is we did not bring Tiao Maori elements into our material other than sort of perfunctory um, sort of um, greetings and uh, beginning of our booklet and we did not sort of talk about how uh, the Maori element, Maori view of water could um, influence and this I can talk about the sort of the whole issue of capabilities and how you actually move from national policy to actually talking about it and uh, so so although there's all the discussion so outside the fact that we didn't actually talk about it they explicitly instruct our participants to consider my reviews of water uh, was actually meant that none of the participants and even those who were maori actually raised um the sort of other absence or importance of te ao maori elements in in the material and um, and so it sort of really um, made it and 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 I want to sort of then say that uh, this we can talk about it also later. This will likely would make our uh, if we actually wanted to uh, come up with some more authoritative conclusions or recommendation, they would probably render them invalid for uh, use. Um, I also want to sort of talk about something that Rachel talked a little bit about how our participants in a way subverted the organizational framing. So if you remember, we um, 
we started with this idea that it's climate uh, change and population pressures that are causing, that, that actually are leading to the need to think about the future water sources. But when we asked our participants about, um, you know, in the question three about the importance of water, many of them actually turned the question sort of upside down and they um, refused this kind of framing that because the population is growing, we need to look for uh, new sources of water. What they basically were telling us, and I've just sort of tried to extract some of the, some of the, um, uh, some of the data and some of the notes uh, that, that we had, they were sort of saying, well, you know, you could also just limit the population growth or not have population growth in this city and, uh, and then sort of not actually think about um, expanding sources of water. So you just like, uh, so, you know, they said, well, why are you saying that um, the, the variable is really the population? And then the last thing that I want to address here, just as a sort of, again, observation, is that what we found that actually the participants' own sharing stories and talking was probably just as important uh, in these conversations uh, compared to the, 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 the materials that we gave them. And what was the most important uh, were experiences of uh, other countries and living overseas and what I put here is just there was one exchange around a table um, and uh, in, in, in our last workshop where the fact that one of, one of the participants told his story about coming from uh, Iran where uh, there were uh, sort of quite um, severe water shortages and need to uh, preserve water pretty much uh, Turn the change the uh, cause the sort of change the opinion and completely change the outlook around the table how they considered some of the forms of water sources that um, they actually considered um, unacceptable at the start and I think sort of the other thing that we found really interesting is that while you know this is just a kind of side observation while this is a very diverse city if you kind of look at it demographically for many of these people was actually the first time to talk to. Um, people who, you know, are recent immigrants from um, countries, um, you know, that they don't necessarily know much about. So I'm just going to sort of stop here. And um, this is really, uh, we, I'm sort of really going through these. So I just sort of wanted to offer some of my really initial observation without actually ability to make a conclusion other than, you know, this, uh, I'm just looking forward to the conversation and um, and the questions because uh, in this you know spirit of um, uh, deliberative process of being iterative and experimental and reflective, this is all going to feed into the process that we are actually planning uh, for the next year. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tatiana. That was really interesting. Um, so we now have about 25 minutes for questions if we want to head off for lunch at 12 30. Um, and we've already got several hands up um, although we've lost a couple already. <laughs> Thank you so, much. so we've got the questions from Tatiana's session and also from um, Rebecca and Simon. Maybe yeah. because that one went first does anyone have any questions that either relate to both or that were kind of burning from before that we wanted to start with? And we also have uh, Matthew as discussion, so I don't know if he has any prepared remarks or I don't know if he wants to make some. Or I did double check. I did check with Matthew if he still wanted to be the discussant. But since you've dubbed him in, Tatiana, perhaps we should uh, we should give you the chance. Matt. Um, yeah. Look. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Tatiana, and thanks um, everybody. Um, I, I was a little a little bit daunted by being. Uh, named a discussant in this sort of role <laughs> and I don't have much to discuss <laughs> uh, other than I mean it's, it's amazing to see um, uh, these projects represented in, in this forum today uh, I, I think I think from, from my perspective there's three things that I think potentially kind of uh, I'd like to kind of perhaps just put on the table for for, for discussion I think it's it's awesome and amazing to hear cross conversation between folks working in SDS and folks working in public participation and deliberative democracy. I think that's something we should do a lot more of, notwithstanding <laughs> my slight, slightly barbed critique, my slightly barbed response to Wendy's notion that there's 
SDS people throwing throwing critiques um, in in one direction. Uh, so perhaps we can talk about that. Um, but but I think this is a really productive conversation, and, and we are such we have such interesting and kind of aligned kind of trajectories of, of sort of research and questions. So 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 that perhaps would be something to sort of put on the table. The other question that I that I have perhaps across across each of the presentations was really around. Um, the, the presence or absence of the material. So, so Tatiana, like I was thinking about your, the, 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 the context of, of talking about water and the degree to which water itself forced its way into those conversations in, in perhaps ways that, that may, may have been not, not as expected as, as, or a bit unanticipated. So, so water itself becomes a little bit unruly in the context of, of, of the discussions you know, in the process you're talking about. And I, and I think we could perhaps multiply that um, or, or, or think about the, the, the presence or absence of the material in each of the different kind of projects, right? So thinking about the materiality of cows and food, thinking about the presence or absence of power, thinking about what, what does anticipation mean and, and, and what, what, what kinds of sort of methodologies and epistemologies are, are evident in the, in the, in the, in the kind of, in the orientation towards towards anticipation, and and I guess I guess that I guess that kind of sense of and I guess the last thing I'd, I'd love to kind of perhaps think about is is, is aligned to this notion of, of, of materiality. So um, we're 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 thinking about and, and across the papers we're really thinking about notions of representation and publics. And I guess one one thing that may come out of this connection between STS and, and deliberative democracy might be questions of emergence and questions of um, uh, the, the relationship between issue issue articulation and and the definition of publics in that in that kind of sense that we might find it in a more SDS sort of context. Um, that's probably enough for me, Kobe. Thanks, Matt. I wanted to emphasize as well that we're working towards broadening discussion to all four of the presentations. So also Wendy and Rachel's. I'm not sure if Rachel had to leave a bit early. Was that something I picked up on? Or is it sharing a I don't know. later? You're here now. Okay, so we don't need to prioritize questions in that order. Um, this has been amazing for me because Wendy and Rachel were both advisors along the way of my PhD thesis. So both of your presentations were really fascinating to see, kind of from my perspective now as a postdoc. And then the applied examples of Tatiana and Rebecca and Simon's work now really interesting it's quite intimidating though i find so i wanted to invite especially the people that haven't spoken yet i'm like i wanted to mention i feel quite intimidated but i would really we i'd really love this to be a participatory discussion so if you don't feel comfortable raising your hand to talk then feel free to put something in the chat um and we can ask it in kind of a more private way so that you're not identified if you don't want to be um tatiana was your hand just up or was that sujata sorry i think it was wendy but um and then after yeah, Wendy. Yeah. I just wanted to um I wanted to allow the people to speak. But anyway. Um so I, I um I I was pulling out a book to look up a quote of Matt's <laughs> just making a nervous Matt. I'll come to that later. <laughs> um so but I wanted to just um reflect on Tatiana's work and thanks Tatiana, that was really interesting to hear about it. And I just wanted to um, share some thoughts that I've had as part of a survey I've done of public engagement activities in Australia, and particularly in relation to these sort of experimental processes um, versus what we might think of as a sort of gold standard deliberative processes. And I think that, you know, basically one of the conclusions of my survey is that the experimental processes can be really valuable um, in being kind of responsive to the context, so kind of designed in place in a, in a particular decision-making context or, or whatever, and, and being quite responsive to that sort of context, they can be more variable in their what we might refer to as quality in kind of external measures, but in terms of their sort of resonance can be, that can be quite high and actually can be higher than gold standard sort of approaches. And, you know, I think that there are some some disadvantages of gold standard approaches, which, which you know, STS scholars have also pointed out. Um, and so I think that, 
drawing on experimentation as a general sort of principle is I think really, really valuable. Um, and you know, we still need to consider, I guess, issues of sort of quality, but they also connect with, again, what the role of these processes are uh, in, these, in these kind of systems. Uh, I'll leave it at that for the moment. Tatiana? Yeah, I, um, I was just really struck by, you know, the, as I mentioned, the, the contrast between, you know, uh, Simon and um, Rebecca's presentation of um, what they call this sort of anticipatory, anticipatory, anticipatory public discussion, uh, where they basically put a question on the table which is not on the table at the moment. And, um, and you know, sort of our work, which was, was quite current in, in, in July and August, and now it's uh, uh, incredibly, um, it has brought so many issues around, um, which are kind of indicated not only about, you know, water and infrastructure and all of these things that are happening, but also around Maori governance, almost like constitution, the, the sort of the settler, the settler farmers versus um, mother uh, versus Maori uh, communities and they're embodied in this um, minister who is a woman and visibly Maori and comes from a, a Kingitanga uh, sort of a Maori uh, movement uh, deeply political and she's become this kind of lightning rod for um, every how shall I say um, reactionary <laughs> um, uh, sort of uh, 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 movements or, or sort of right wing in in New Zealand um, and and it's become really really political. So then I just want to kind of ask. Um, so so in a sense, like so, what I'm saying is that we don't have to worry about in a sense of political impact or sort of whether what we're doing because it, it's happening anyway. But I was wondering, uh, Simon and Rebecca, do you actually think about unintentional consequences of putting this on the table when it's not already there and sort of starting something that um, it's hard to control <laughs> in a way. It's just yeah. Uh, sorry, Tatiana, I think I mean, so putting on the table, we, we're talking about sort of... Um, anything, for instance, like gene editing may, you know, it was, G, so GMOs were a huge question and then they were, and gene editing became a kind of big question, but in the last few years, I don't think it's, and maybe it was somewhat overshadowed by some other sort of issues. Yeah. I don't know, maybe, maybe it just sort of seems, you don't think so? I don't know. Depends where you are. I guess so, yeah. I mean, but, I mean... I think, not to speak for you, but since I was there, Simon and Rebecca, I mean, I do think that people did take it in lots of directions, particularly kind of it, the whole session ended up renewing concerns about embryo experimentation, which wasn't exactly where I thought you were probably heading. I mean, it was interesting they did that, but, you know, so, but I'd be interested, Tatiana, why do you think it's a problem to draw people's attention to issues that maybe have quieted down or, I don't think it's a problem. I, I'm just, I'm sort of wondering, yeah, I'm just sort of trying to work it out. Is it like we've raised it, but let's say we can't do anything about it. Um, you know, we don't have, like in open and deliberative processes, it's about, we have authority to, to talk, you know, to give it to somebody or whatever you know, the government, the organization or something, and we've raised this issue, uh, you know, are we raising expectations that something is going to happen and it's not? I guess that's what I'm... There's a lot of, a lot of moving parts in your question. I mean, Rebecca, I mean, you might have a, have a, a response to this, but, um, uh, yeah, no, so, you know, it's a reiterated Gwenning's point, it partly depends on what the, the function is. Um, and, you know, if it is, a, it is oriented toward decision-making, which has um, there's some challenges associated with that, which we can elaborate on another time. Uh, we won't, won't get into that right now. But um, you know, it, it, it's I mean, from a purely delivery perspective, it should never be uh, seen as problematic, um, because uh, you know. So if, if we break down the role of deliberation, I mean, it, it, partly what it does in an ideal sense, and then of course, you know, we've got variations on that theme, is that it it kind of sets. The scope in terms of what's what's relevant, what's important. You know, we we, we see you know this is what should be considered. These are the interests of others, interests of environment, cultural differences, and so on. And so part of the job is actually sort of getting across all that and and, and scoping that out. 
Um, and then actually somehow sort of integrating all that information into a position via, via you know, through a delivery process. And that's, I mean, that's a very sort of technical sort of view on it all. But new information should never be problematic. But as a challenge in terms of design, because you, you know, it's very hard to, to hold all these threads together, uh, you know, especially in it's a short pro process. And this is you know, racial sort of made the observation in relation to the Australian citizens jury. There was an element of this, and we we've actually teased that out in our, our survey analysis. Um, you know, the extent to which that occurred, and what we did observe actually is that it tended to occur more with particular individuals of particular starting positions uh, which is a very interesting sort of observation we need to, to you know develop a bit more uh, do some more work on but it's it's never a problem a problem is in itself but it's a challenge uh is, is the way i'd say it said it as particularly if there's not an opportunity to really work through whether it is kind of a a, a rabbit hole in, in a sense or you know does this actually feed into the way we you know, we you know we, we should determine uh, the issue and that's a that's a collective decision i mean that's something a delivery process should ideally do um, uh, yeah, is actually sort of yeah, determine what John and I would make, might call meta consensus uh, in terms of this is the, the, the these are the, the 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 components we need to consider. So, um, hmm. so Josh has had a hand up for a little while. You got oh to yeah, no, that's fine. Um, yeah, this has been so amazing. Um, I've got lots of okay, but I'll try and stick to two. So one is just picking up on this point um, about raising expectations or. Um, Tatiana, that you raised. And I wonder, part of the issue there is also uh, raising expectations that uh, this technology, especially when it's centered around, yeah, technologies, maybe in the water case, it's not quite the same, um, uh, but these things will actually do what they say on the tin, right? Um, and that's, you know, a question one could raise for um, the people who are making those promises on behalf of those technologies, but maybe also for the people who are doing kind of public engagement around it. Uh, and I don't know if that was part of what you were thinking. Maybe it doesn't apply in the water case, but um, certainly with GM gene editing and so forth. Um, uh, yeah, that kind of gap between promises and you know realities. Because I think we know these things are not going to fix problems. Um, uh, once and uh, and forever. Um, but the the question that I had for I think all four talks um, uh, was how we think about what counts as um, knowledge that comes out of um, these various deliberative um, activities, and how is that then distinguished from stuff that you know, when we present this, it might be easy for people to listen to, you know, the Iran example you were say, you were giving Tatiana and say, oh, you know, that's like, oh, yeah, that's interesting. That's somebody's opinion, right? Um, or, yeah, in all of these things, you know, issues to do with those kind of broader systemic issues that I think, Rachel, both you and um, Wendy talked about. Um, it, I find it incredibly challenging in a, in a way where, you know, I, sometimes I might be speaking about these things and they somehow fall into a box, which is sort of not about knowledge that you get from these uh, activities, right? It's, um, it's something else. It's like soft stuff. It's values or it's um, opinions or yeah, something else. And I guess, yeah. And I wondered, I mean, certainly the genome editing uh, work as well, is there, is that part of the kind of epistemic uh, abstinence issue um, that we need to think about where, yeah, some of the outputs from deliberations can are actually part of the epistemic foundations that we need to consider in um, making sense of these interventions, or making, making sense of, um, yeah, what we should do about water futures and so forth. They are not just like merely um, the soft stuff, um, yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to have a go with that if, if uh, no one else um, does. But uh, yeah, knowledge, it's, it's a, a, first of all, I mean, epistemic abstinence, I, I confess that the first time I've come across the term was actually in Wendy's abstract, and I've lost the thread in terms of the, uh, the definition. Um, so um, forgive me if I, if I do uh, a rough injustice um, to, to the terms. But in terms of knowledge, um, and an epistemic, uh, you know, what we what we define as epistemic and you know, deliberative, deliberative process. It, it, I, I think it's not something you can actually predetermine the boundaries of. 
uh, at all. And I think it's actually less my point about meta consensus. Like, it's the relevant knowledge here, and of course that includes things that we might actually you know, traditionally call facts. But irrelevant knowledge here is that, uh, in terms of deliberative sense, is that there are value sets and differences which are relevant, and you know, even knowledge about that is an important source of knowledge. Uh, so it's a, it's a difference of category of knowledge. Um, but uh, if it is determined, it just you know, it's having worked through the issues and and it actually informs uh, the way we think about the issue, that is a relevant uh, piece of knowledge for the purpose of deliberation. So there's an element of social construction in that, but the, you know, which actually also is responsive to what we might call you know, the harder you know, sort of epistemic forms of knowledge, they, they integrate together, um, which is actually something we, we analyzed, which would have been in our second presentation, which we haven't had long story why uh, we'll have to we have to do that next year but we need to gather more data uh to tell this story uh to you know to, to and actually develop this narrative around knowledge uh in a delivery process and, and its function uh, and meaning but yeah the, the broad story is not predetermined it's discursively determined and that's part of that meaning making process while you know without actually i mean i wouldn't actually kick away the idea of you know sort of grounded knowledge in, in you know sort of scientific knowledge uh, that's very important but they interact together i hope that addresses the, the question yeah i mean maybe we can come back to this i guess i was thinking you know there's knowledge about the material biophysical stuff as well that can come out of these things not only knowledge about values and i'm thinking yeah i mean there's work that sarah hartley's done for example on gene drive and doing public engagement around that in, um, I think it was in Mali, you know, you get these questions that people raise. Well, if you want to, if you eliminate um, these um, malaria causing uh, mosquitoes, what does that do to the ecosystem? Um, and in a way that's an epistemic question, right? It's about, um, it's about, it's about material realities and not only about their values, if you like. So yeah, maybe- A very quick response, sorry, uh, very, very quick. Um, is that yeah? Of course, it's not going to do the research uh, in, in relation to these matters. But what the what these processes can do is actually define what are the relevant questions. Uh, and and something that which can happen is they actually generate questions that hadn't been anticipated, that would inform the, the you know the progress of actually seeking knowledge to address them. Wendy or Rachel, did you want to respond to that? Because Shatter had kind of addressed the talk for you. Tatiana. Sorry, I just, sorry, I just had a, a, a phone call. I didn't actually hear that I was just that's, that's okay. Um, sorry, uh, to respond to this. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm actually, I'm finding it really hard, I suppose, to kind of draw a nice line, not only around, you know, what participants, but even myself, I mean, just to say, um, an anecdote, I wrote a, like a little piece for a local Auckland sort of, uh, a blog, just a kind of public piece. And then the first person to comment was someone who participated in the workshop. And they were sort of sending a feedback and then it was sort of not in that place, but they were sort of saying, this is what worked and this is what I liked. And I found this quite sort of amazing that, you know, we sort of thought we are going to learn from this, but we were kind of learning from all this um, sort of strange entry points into, but that, that particular um, website where I wrote, is a, a place where people who are interested in the city, but especially about transport and housing. So someone who actually is interested in transport, you know, so they're talking about from that perspective. So, yeah, I mean, um, thanks. I would like to, um, Sujata, if you can share this um, reference that you mentioned, it would be quite interesting because I'm, I'm trying to kind of work out all these things. And especially when we saw that, how these, you know, personal narratives could sway people much more persuasively than, I mean, I'm talking about short, short workshops, so these are not like full deliberative processes, which is why we call them workshops, but it was still very interesting. I mean, I, I picked one, but it wasn't the only one that we found. Yeah. I think I, um, Matthew had a hand. Yeah, that's good. Matt, you've got the hand up. Yeah, thanks, and sorry for talking <laughs> twice. Um, I guess I wanted to come back to this issue about raising expectations, which is, I guess, a, a really interesting way of framing an observation that's been made in different contexts. And, and, uh, and in particular, thinking about this in the emerging tech space. Um, so one of one of the reflections that um, I've heard expressed and I've expressed as well is that in the emerging tech space, you, you set up some sort of public dialogue process and then the object 
of the public dialogue disappears instantly. So, you know, nanotechnology suddenly looks a lot less like nanotechnology, a lot more like chemistry, and nanomedicine doesn't seem to work, and synthetic biology, what, 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 it, what is that? You, you know, so like this thing that looks like the object disappears the moment it becomes a focus of public deliberation. And I wonder if that's a shared experience. And, and if it is, <laughs> I, I wonder if there's a, a context for a way of reflecting on that. So I'll oh, see you later, Rachel, yeah. Um, like that, that sort of sense that um, in, so I've had some involvement in the area of nanotechnology. One, one of the aspects of nanotech was an argument at the beginning that said, nanotechnology has particular social outcomes that are different from its constituent parts and need to be the focus of concerted public dialogue. And so in that sense, public dialogue was central to the creation of this field. So it was, in a sense, a work of distinction between nanotechnology and physics and chemistry and all the rest of it. And, and I wonder if something similar is going on in some of the fields in which we work. And I wonder if that, that might cause us to think about what it is that we're deliberating on here <laughs> and, and, and what, what does that look like? Wendy, you wanted to respond? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Yeah, great. And I think, um, I suppose that's what I was trying to get at with the MD box too, is, you know, when we un unpack it, then the, the science kind of disappears. And what I'm finding really fascinating is um, thinking about deliberation about food, about water, about energy. I think that creates a really different context to the engagements about emerging technology that we've seen. Um, and that relates to this issue of, of material participation um, much more directly. So, I mean, you know, I'm only beginning to kind of think about what that distinction is, but I think it's a really interesting and important one. Thanks, Wendy. That is really interesting. And something that struck me, linking back to Wendy and Rachel's presentations in relation to that, what you're talking about, you know, what is food and water and energy? is the difference between things that we ha we engage with on a daily basis, so in that sense, that kind of materiality, versus the, the things that are kind of either abstract ideas or future ideas mm -hmm. that we may or may not. And I think that's related to what Tatiana was raising in terms of um, Simon and Rebecca's project, in terms of here's something that may or may not, you know, be, maybe, but, or is, you know, but then, and so that's quite a different grounding compared to the things that we use and, and have on a daily basis. And I'm really interested in the, in the locus of consumer engagement. Wendy, yours is, you're the centre of yours is policy making, right? And I remember my work being centred around policy making, which I feel like is, is different to now, where I'm kind of almost in a, looking at a disaster response frame. So there's a disaster or, and trying to anticipatory approaches to present, preventing disaster as the kind of centre and then we'll, what nudges and what behaviours and what interventions, so that intervention framing was really interesting to me, can mitigate that, can, can, and can stop the, the negative effects of that. So I think that cuts across in some ways too. If, and if I could just um, speak to that, Kobe, yeah, I, um, I'm, you know, that model is quite un unsatisfactory to me in thinking about science engagement because it's, yeah, really focused on um, not just policy making, but, but particular um, policy making, you know, um, in government and, and so much of this relates to governance more broadly um, and even when it's primarily um, public policy or, or government as in Tatiana's case, it's often these government agencies which are operating in slightly different ways and, and interacting with other uh, non-state actors in, in different ways as well. So yeah, I mean that, that system actually needs to be complicated. Yeah, I think. I think it's, uh, I guess, 12.34 in Sydney and 2.34. So um, we um, we could, I mean, we are meeting in, um, in one hour. We can be a few minutes late, given that um, Simon and Rebecca are not giving that paper. Although you can maybe spend five minutes just say in few words what this was going to be about, if you want. Um, not particularly. <laughs> Uh, I, I, yeah, I'm sorry, my apologies. I'm, it's going to be very tough for me to be in the next session. Um, oh, okay. we're, we're actually preparing the, uh, the, the grant. To, okay. We made it through the final round of John Templeton. We'd be given 
another two weeks to turn it around a four million dollar proposal so i have to uh, i have to spend the afternoon working on that okay uh, an invitation for a follow-up session then building on some of the stuff that we touched on this morning but didn't get the chance to because i do think it's good especially because there's another session during the lunch break today yeah that we do have a break now in case people want to participate in that other session or have other responsibilities yeah um, but this has been really useful and i definitely think i mean matt given your ambition this morning about what we were going to get out of that session before this one i definitely think that there's scope to then go on from here and maybe like one focus specifically on Simon and Rebecca's project and one focus on Tatiana's project. Like I'd be interested in being involved in both time dependent, as we all know is important. Um, you know, I could, I could come back in if we, if we schedule that discussion a little bit later in the next session, I could, I could probably make it in. Um, so if, if, that, if that's what people want, oh, I'm happy to join in, uh, another discussion another time. Um, Simon, we also have, um, we also have another discussion at the end of the next. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you can come in at, at okay. whatever stage i'm sure we can have a useful discussion oh, i will i will chime in sounds good okay. thanks okay. well i'll see you all in one hour, one hour a little bit less i'll open it um and then we can see into the scheduled time um better um to those i don't know if there's anybody here who don't know about the slide change in the program Rebecca and Simon will not be presenting the paper uh, on epistemic deliberation. Uh, we may hear a little bit about the plans for that paper a little bit later. Uh, so I'll just sort of just start a sort of slightly changed uh, session. So uh, welcome again. I would like this is a little bit funny. I will kind of, I need to I think acknowledge the land where the conference is formally taking place, although I don't know if anybody here is actually in Wollongong, uh, on the uh, Daraval Yuin and Wadi Wadi land, which had not been ceded. Uh, I am in Auckland, uh, Tamaki Makaro, which has 19 tribes, and the tribe or Iwi where University is uh, located is Nati Fatwa Auraki. Um, so the plan for uh, the next 15 minutes or so is uh, we are going to continue to have a discussion from the first around the intersections of deliberation uh, and deliberative theory and SDS and then we'll continue as a schedule per program and um, I don't know if there's anybody who wants to raise any questions that remained unanswered or you wanted to continue anything from the first or who didn't have a chance to ask questions. No? Do Wendy, do you want to do your facilitator? Sure. So I just thought um, it would be it would be interesting just to hear from everyone what they're finding interesting out of this session, what what's coming up for you and what are you mulling over and what sort of questions might you have? And it can be really unformed. But it would be great to hear from everyone. So I wondered if I could actually go around um, and I'll do that according to my screen. That's okay. And, it, and no compulsion. If you don't want to talk, it's, it's absolutely fine. I don't think Rachel's here yet. So uh, Rebecca, what's coming up for you? Um, there were a couple of things actually. And like I said, I'm quite new to this. So it's quite exciting to, to hear these thoughts. Um, I really like the idea of the unruly materiality. <laughs> Um, bringing out emergent sort of issues in, um, in the deliberations and I think it's interesting when you're talking about genetics because obviously it's something that everybody can um, relate to everybody has genetics um, and there were a lot of participants in our um, in our deliberations who did make very sort of personal connections with um, if not the technology at least the the um, the topics and the issues that it brought up and i think it also relates to what wendy was talking about about you know bringing in this context one of the things that i found was that the participants were were pretty good at bringing in the context themselves and, and instead of us trying to um kind of create the context that they, that was relevant for them they were able to sort of 
take this this topic of genome editing and really relate it to contexts in their own lives that we would never have thought of. Um, so that really struck me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, Darren, I'm not sure if you were with us before, so you may not have anything coming up yet. I was listening in the background. Okay. I'm, I'm forced to multitask, so I got these sessions on in the background, so I wouldn't waste your time with random, random comments. Oh, thanks anyway. Um, Kobe? Sorry, I literally just joined because I was getting babe to sleep. Sorry, so, so also like, just, maybe not useful. We're just having a, a brief time, each person, to talk about what's come up for us so far and what, what's been interesting. I found the, the locus really interesting in terms of your graph at the start with kind of public policy in the middle and things kind of radiating out from there and um, the different kind of focus on water and particularly kind of water as a body in New Zealand and what that, or Aotearoa and what that means, um, which I think related to that materiality. Um, that's been something that stood out for me. Mm, interesting, great, thanks. Um, Josh, are you with us? Able to share? Hello. Hi. Sorry. I'm um, trying to do this without being around the computer. Um, look, it's been very interesting. I'm very much uh, uh, liking following the discussion and I guess the, the particular angle which I'm uh, listening in for Kenny, which popped up a bit in the first session is how do the various goals and aspirations that the, the researchers who presented in the last session and perhaps this session as well apply differentially to things where we do not have any time of our sleeve, aka runaway climate change versus other things where the consequences to enact the various um, proposals may have, you know, a decade or two to, to be matured and realised in the world, which is um, something which I don't think it applies to the climate crisis we find ourselves in. But um, it's all very interesting. Yeah. Thanks, Jess. Great. Um, so do you have anything to, to mention? Um, yeah, well, I love the uh, visualizations of um, the system, uh, you know, that I think, you, Wendy, that was yours, the sort of technology as a slice as opposed to this kind of system. But in many ways, I think each of the talks um, opened, um, opened up that way of thinking, which I, I, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's close to my, my heart, as, as you know. Um, I get, yeah, there are a couple of things that I wanted to briefly highlight maybe so one was actually the very specific point you made Rebecca about um, how jurors wanted to hear more advocacy um, both pro and anti and uh, and that was like wow okay that's yeah that's really I mean in a way it's a sort of you know there are I guess you know classical positions in the theory of democracy but also in uh, philosophy of science I think you know like, um, that actually um, uh, conflict or disagreement, you know, like in a Popperian way or something is actually is good for, it's not a bad thing. I mean, very often controversies are seen as problematic, um, but there is a bit of a tradition of, you know, seeing controversy, um, opposition and so forth as um, constructive in a way, you know, we learn things, we, you know, new knowledge is produced and so forth. And there's a version of that sort of um, view also, I think, in theories of democracy. Um, so yeah, I wondered, I think some of the ways in which, uh, I mean, Matt knows more about these, but my impression of some of the UK deliberative dialogues was there ended, there was advocacy in some of them, some of those um, dialogue exercises, but maybe only on sort of on behalf of a new technology and maybe less so in terms of providing a, you know, substantially um, developed, um, yeah, oppositional position. Um, yeah, I may be wrong, but um, I, yeah, I thought that, yeah, the role of advocacy, uh, it, maybe it's relevant to all of, all the talks again as well. Um, yeah, you may want to think about that. I think that's a really interesting conversation. I'd have something to say about that too, but let's just continue the round and then we'll come back to these. So Roberta, what's been coming up for you? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think it's, yeah, it's been amazing. I really enjoyed listening to everyone's presentation. Um, 
Yeah, I guess uh, some of the things coming to me might be sort of the relationship between uh, knowledge making practices and, you know, the the idea of expertise and what's who's an expert and um, and the relationship with this concept of public. And so I don't know, I'm thinking about how all these definitions or all these um, or the way we think about these uh, practices sort of shapes the way problems are built and um, what's the role of the the yeah ma the material aspects um, of yeah of these relationships of these practices and as Matt was saying before about thinking about you know the unruly matter I really like that um, as well and how that might change the way we think about we can the, the way we think about we engage um with these you know concepts of expertise and democracy and deliberation um yeah i don't know something related to that thanks roberta gray um tatiana any thoughts okay it's coming up for you can i um can i actually um address what josh was asking about yeah so i'm i mean i mean you may i mean you probably know josh about you know climate assemblies but i actually find much more attractive the i don't know if you've read the work of rebecca willis um too hot to handle democratic challenge of climate change and her argument is that i guess the liberative processes are the way to go in particular at the local level because that's the way you can as she sort of puts it Part, sort of parcel and package something as enormous as climate change in a way that's tangible and you know just accessible so that people really can can, can understand what it means for them and she claims that uh, deliberative processes at this sort of small as many public citizens implemented at local level she talks about counties in the UK uh, both uh, make sense from the normative argument so instead of like so actually because they are democratic so you can sort of solve it without um, going for you know a kind of technocratic authoritarian we'll just you know implement what it takes and just go with it and the second is a kind of instrumental argument in a sense that uh, this is how politicians will also gain um, the sort of the I guess the courage when you know you can communicate this to people people can understand then politicians can also have the support and sort of the courage to implement things that are difficult so i mean here is like this is the way of democracy to go and this is this is how we can actually do it um so and i i find it i don't know having participated in some very difficult uh participatory engagement um encounters with local citizens around you know carbon reducing measures and um i tend to agree but although i haven't actually tested personally how that would work um yeah so that, that's just what i wanted to to mention i'm not so sure about climate assemblies though the kind of big national level i think then we we risk again this sort of the, the big huge problem we we can't capture any sort of it's all these sort of different bits and pieces, I think, yeah. Oh yeah, you mentioned it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, Matt, have you got something that's come up? Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I guess I guess a couple of things really. Um, so, I mean, firstly, as I said before, it's, 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 these discussions are fantastic and, and we should have more of them. Um, one, I guess two observations. One, one is the kind of the, the difference in tone between the language we use. So, I guess I'm, I tend tend towards the language of participation, which I think is a slightly broader term than engagement and deliberation. Although I, I do use both <laughs> deliberation and engagement in different contexts. So, what strikes me is interesting about participation. So, I'm, I'm like texting a friend at the moment um, because her kid's just been sent home because there's kids in her class with COVID and we're negotiating like where's the best place to go and get your kid tested and all that kind of what I would call participatory kind of negotiation of a biomedical sort of enterprise, which is very different from 
deliberation, but I wonder if there's something there in that in that sort of context. Um, so Jatha mentioned the, the British um, kind of public dialogues um, and, and, and the, the notion of kind of advocacy, and, and, and which I think is a really important part of our discussion. And there certainly was, um, you know, I was involved in the public dialogues on synthetic biology and nanomedicine particularly. Um, and there was lots of conversations about forms of science advocacy as part of the expert interventions in, in those dialogue processes. From my perspective, I, I actually don't have a problem with advocacy. What I have a problem with is, is the suggestion that advocacy is just the voice from science. Uh, because like for, as from a social science perspective, I, I want to be an advocate for certain forms of democratic intervention. And I want to be able to do that um, openly, <laughs> not just sneak it through methodologically as it were. And I think we should be in a, be in a position to of, of be able to be reflexive and, and open about that. And so what I want to encourage my science colleagues to be doing is, is to be up articulating that their, 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 their participation in, in some forms of public dialogue does take the form of advocacy, uh, rather than to assume that we, we can, you know, uh, avoid advocacy altogether. Thanks, Matt. Um, I might go next, um, and just to follow on from that, I think we, we actually had an interesting discussion about advocacy in relation to the genome editing process, and um, maybe that might have just been amongst the facilitators. Um, but just just the idea that the, the the experts were presenting facts, they weren't advocating, was kind of interesting because because we feel that they were, um, and that you know, following on from Matt's comments, I think they. Um, yeah, it was a bit of stealth advocacy in a way. You know, even though, you know, they were seen as sort of neutral, but they, they, they really, really weren't. And it wasn't a strong advocacy, but I think it was, you know, some form of advocacy all the same. Um, yeah, and I, and I think that, so I think that also what the, the citizens were looking for when, um, was not necessarily different forms of advocacy, but um, different perspectives. So, all, you know, all the perspectives were a university researchers, for example. Um, yeah, I mean, and also just for me in terms of uh, this whole discussion, um, this concept of engagement has been really problematic for me for a long time, <laughs> ever since I've been, you know, engaging with it. It's, it's, it's been a kind of core part of what I do, but I, you know, I'd like to drop it if I could. <laughs> um, and especially now, my work in energy has really shifted my, my thinking about kind of engagement and because now we've got engagement with, with energy, engagement with systems, with technologies. And um, yeah, so I think there's a lot of kind of confusion about that, but also a lot of kind of richness. Um, and I don't, so I don't think, particip I think participation is a really important part of that, but it doesn't cover off everything that's important in what, we, what we're doing here and what we're talking about. Anyway, that's me. So I, Adam, I've had you next anyway, and you've got your hand up, so go. Yeah, sure, sorry. I, ooh, what's happened? Sorry, I was trying to lower my hand. I would like to hear more about how these deliberative processes have actually fed into or changed government policies, because presumably that's one of the aims of these processes, but uh, we haven't heard too much about that. Rachel, are you with us? Oh, she's here. Hello. I'm eating lunch because I was doing another seminar in between. Wow. Um, I would say that um, in the case of our recent sort of focus group stuff, which wasn't deliberative as such, it wasn't aimed to have a particular policy outcome, but the research is um, part of what's been put out there by Fazans on their consultation around ways in which people think about um, new breeding technologies, labeling, and what should be, which account is GM or not. Um, I think, you know, not to speak for the, the gene editing group, but the gene editing thing, even though there wasn't a direct policy on the table, it did feed into policy making in as much as there were a number of regulators and policymakers who came along and were very struck by 
hearing, you know, general public um, uh, working with ideas that are firmly in their domain. So there are people from the TGA, from the OGTR, from NHMRC, and so on. Um, so I think those are more likely to be what happens. I think it's very rare that we end up with kind of that perfect moment where, you know, we have the funding and the arrangements and so on right at the moment it's something's going to, you know, be considered in policy. I think more often it's going to have to be finding the sweet spot where it's not completely hypothetical. It is picking up on something that's a hotbed, a hot button uh, policy issue um, at a time at which um, what comes out of it might make a difference. Um, and that's part of it too, is always when you're planning these things is to allow the time at the end to make sure what you get then gets on the table in some way with regulators, policymakers, parliamentary, you know, wherever it might be that the policy might be being made. I don't know if that helps, but you know, that's um, part of what, um, what I think about surely when we, when we do these things, but we're not strictly doing deliberative, you know, fora. I don't know whether um, Wendy and uh, Rebecca want to talk about the gene editing and the way in which it fits in um, policymaking. Um, I, I would just briefly say I've done some work on deliberative impacts, which looks at sort of direct and indirect influence on policy in different ways. So you might find that interesting. I haven't written it in a paper, but it's in a report that I'll put the link up to. But I'm also noticing the time. I think it might be great to return to thinking about the genome editing process connections to policy. Um, but I think we want Matt's presentation now. Actually, I think this is a really interesting, interesting discussion. I'm, I'm loath to cut it off. So, um, whatever works. Um, and one thing, I, one thing I just wanted to register before I break, break into my conversation is, and this is things that Rachel will know about quite specifically. I think is that um, some of the advocacy work also happens further up the chain. So, you know, I was um, tangentially involved in commenting on various different ECOLA reports where that, that frames some of the calls that go you know, through the MRF. MRFF around precision medicine. And so th th those were pretty live debates about what constituted precision medicine. <laughs> so there was huge amounts of advocacy from different perspectives in the constitution of this, the object that then became the, the centre of the public discussion. So perhaps we can register that a little bit later, like not all of this happens at the, at the, at the public deliberation phase, but often it's, things are pre-framed um, quite substantially. Um, I, I'm going to sh hopefully share, if I can get my um, PowerPoint up here, um, some ongoing work with um, that perhaps, perhaps starts, starts from a slightly different place. But um, to begin with, I want to obviously acknowledge that I'm speaking from the land of the Bidjigal people of the Aura Nation, as I, as I acknowledged previously. As I said, um, I think forms of acknowledgement uh, really significant for um, the way in which scholars in HPS and STS work. I, I, also, part of this acknowledgement is, is the fact that I'm speaking from the suburbs of Western Sydney, um, which were, I think, differentially uh, ex experienced quite a differential relation in relation to COVID and COVID lockdowns over the last couple of months. And that will become relevant <laughs> in the next few minutes. Uh, and also just to um, acknowledge that this is a, a, a Part of a larger ARC project with my colleague Richard Mello, Akari Lancaster, Laura McLaughlin, and Alison Ritter, where we're working on specifically on uh, uh, participatory processes and participatory uh, experiences in the context of drug uh, policy reform, particularly in, in the context in, in this paper around opioid uh, uh, treatment uh, policies. So, in the in the framing of, of this session, uh, science, public engagement, delivery of democracy. Uh, I, I wanted to sort of reflect on the words science, public, engagement, deliberative, and democracy, but from a slightly different perspective. And, and I'm not sure whether I'll get to all of that. But I wanted to kind of perhaps ad ad address these, these themes from sideways and to emphasise the terminology of participation in comparison to the, to the terminology of engagement. And to emphasise in particular three aspects of participation. To, to work with um, Noche Mares on the, on the material context and enactments 
of participation. So what does participation mean in, 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 in practice, in the making? To emphasise, as I've worked with my colleague Jason Chilvers on, on the ecological and, and co-productive relationalities between participatory formations, between collectives of participation. And then also to work with um, the work of Chris Kelty uh, around what he describes as the figure of the participant, this, this somewhat chaotic and, and uh, often ill-defined figure that, that features in, in much of our work. And I wanted to begin the, the presentation with two, um, two figures of participation. Uh, the one of which perhaps might be quite familiar, which is um, the, the figure of, of the Chief Health Officer of New South Wales at, at one of the, the now infamous COVID uh, press conferences. Uh, and then the second is a, is a, uh, is a, is a quotation from, from, from the research that I presented in a few moments. So, so let, me, let me play this clip here from, from Kerry Chant and then I'll, I'll, I'll address the quote in a second. If you had curfews, if you brought in the 10K to 5K, would it have any effect on mobility? Would it have any effect on the virus? So there's a number of um, areas that we've identified as hotspot areas, such as the local government areas, and they've got restrictions on staying within those local government areas, um, either the suburb or the local government area. So there's actually quite a lot of restrictions on people's movements. There's a restriction on travel for recreation. Um, and we do ask people to um, look, move locally. And um, from a public health perspective, we're looking at, um, we're engaging with a wide range of experts and again, we're not afraid of putting up a range of options. And I think the key point is we need to make sure we're looking closely at the data to understand how transmission is continuing to occur and how we can work with affected communities. <coughs> they are the most <coughs> vibrant communities in, I think, in New South Wales. And I personally believe that they will show us the way and we just need to partner with them in a way um, to support them and to support their communities. They are very strong communities. And I also want to say that we will look at every public health intervention across the world that's been implemented and look at how they could be um, being done all the way through to how rapid, um, rapid antigen testing can be used, how we can um, look at basically everything in terms of the best way to provide support to government in, in terms of advice on initiatives to get these numbers down. So that, that, that may be bring back some, <laughs> some, some memories of, of, of life, life during a lockdown here in New South Wales and for those of you who are in different states and your own experiences. But the context here for, for chance observations and interventions here was the, was the announcement of differential uh, lockdown measures in the suburbs of Western Sydney, where I also happen to live. Um, and, and really interesting kind of language emerging in this press conference around the idea of affected communities um, showing us the way and that we need to partner with those communities. Now, of course, what's not captured in the clip is the, is the next set of questions were about um, whether the trip should be sent in to go door to door in those same communities. So a very different kind of political space around direct intervention um, by, the, by, the, by, the, by the military and the police uh, uh, articulated in the, with, with some navigation here, you know, evoking the language of participation and, and partnership. I'll come back to this in the final moments of my presentation. The, the, the second um, set of quotes here are drawn from a set of interviews with uh, policymakers and, and, and professionals working in, in COVID response in the context of, uh, of opioid substitution treatment. And the language here is a, is a different kind of language, a language of the huddle. So the, the huddle uh, emerged as a, as a form of policymaking, a form of institutional practice that supplemented and to some degree augmented existing participatory formations that to date had, had, uh, had dominated the, 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 the formal processes through which uh, policymakers, experts, um, medical practitioners and, 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 and representative organisations come together to consider uh, you know, sort of policy reform in the context of, 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 uh, of drugs. The huddle became this much more sort of fast paced, somewhat insurgent, somewhat emergent sort of form where, where 
quite quickly, policy in, in interventions that have been argued for for many years were implemented uh, with a degree of speed. So what I'm interested in thinking about in this paper is these two sort of figures of participation. One is a, is a figure where, where, where there seems to be, in, in one sense, a, 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 an orientation to participation that, that is precious and contingent. Uh, and it's quickly shut down through, through, for example, calls for uh, compliance and police and military. On the other hand, what I'm interested in thinking about here is the, is the, is the emergent practices of participation where very established kind of, kind of modes uh, somewhat lock, uh, you know, are experienced as, as locking policy making into, into quite entrenched positionalities and, and quite slow processes. And in the context of a public health emergency, and we've been thinking about urgency uh, the, over the last few minutes, that these more emergent forms become, become possible. So I've got, a, I've got a brief paper here, which I'll um, probably read out, and, but so Wendy, just kick me off if I'm, if I'm going too long. So the international um, commentary has characterized COVID-19 crisis as, a, as an opportunity to go uh, beyond business as usual. And, and, and particularly in the area that we're, we're looking at in relation to drug law reform and drug policy reform, there's often this sort of sense that COVID is a, you know, has a sort of silver lining one striking feature of COVID-19 has been the adoption of, of patient-oriented policy changes surrounding the provision of methadone and, uh, and ribromorphine-assisted uh, treatment programs, uh, or, or broadly characterised as, as, as opioid pharmacotherapy. In the context of the multifaceted and uneven political and policy responses to COVID-19, which have spanned you know, from reactionary to repressive, uh, the implementation of more flexible uh, regulations around, around, around opioid pharmacotherapy has been viewed as somewhat of a silver lining, as I said before. And there are many well-documented reasons why the COVID-19 pandemic presents unique challenges for people involved in opioid uh, pharmacotherapy treatment. And so broadly speaking, what, what's been happening in, a, in Australia and, and more generally is that policy uh, uh, communities and policymakers have temporarily in some cases, and, and that's, a, that's an empirical question, allowed for more flexible delivery methods. Uh, for instance, allowing clients to obtain takeaway doses of, of methadone and buprenorphine, uh, using telemedicine and, and, and a whole range of other kind of arrangements that, that, that allow for much more flexible uh, treatment in the context of COVID-19. Now, what's interesting in this context is, is that these were policy um, proposals that, that had been made for many, many years and have been made in particular through very established um, processes through which the drug user community participates in policy making, but had really failed to, uh, uh, to, 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 to gather traction in a, in a policy context, but were adopted really quite quickly in, 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 in the shadow of COVID-19. In Australia, the drug user movement is, is particularly strong, it's, it's dated back to the 1980s, we've gained prominence in the context of, of, of another emergency situation, namely the HIV and AIDS crisis. The success of, 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 of responses in Australia to HIV and AIDS have been attributed to the participatory processes developed between community and, and the federal and state governments at the time. And, and I think you can hear some of that, some of the legacies of that in Chart's uh, kind of articulation of a notion of community partnership. The kind of articulations of the values of community partnership in, 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 with affected communities. So, so in the wider context of participatory democracy, more generally, drug policy processes have for many years been characterised by concerted efforts to uh, promote community, consumer and community participation, which have largely resulted in the establishment of a range of participatory structures, consultative committees, consumer panels, roundtables, drug summits, and so on. And at the same time, the establishment of these institutionalised uh, forms of participation has stabilised and in some, some degree delimited policy processes around procedural mechanisms for participation and inclusion. As my colleague Carrie Lancaster and, and, and her colleagues argue, and I'm quoting here, calls for greater consumer participation in health policy, decision making and drug policy processes, commonly envisaged and coordinated through the slogan, nothing without us, so nothing about us without us, have resulted in the creation of formalised processes for the inclusion of voices and the perspectives of, of people who, who, who live with experience of drug use in processes, particularly policy design, deliberation, implementation and evaluation. In a context where I'm quoting again, policies and practices already constitute people who use drugs as, as, as irrational and illegitimate political subjects. 
So in this sense, what we see is the inauguration of relatively prescriptive and formalised mechanisms for consumer inclusion participation that are regarded simultaneously as hard-won outcomes of long-term activism, whilst at the same time structuring, you know, functioning to structure drug consumption, and indeed the, 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 the figure of the consumer in politically salient terms. So what then is striking in, in this context is, is that in the unfolding of the COVID-19 public health emergency, what we saw across Australia and internationally was, was the adoption of, of opioid pharmacotherapy policies designed to reduce face-to-face -face contact between clients and dispensers and, and, and prescribers of medicines. The policy changes included uh, changes in, in guidance and on takeaway dosing, et cetera. And in the written version of this paper, we detail the ways in which these often quite incremental policy changes, which had been, quote, on the table uh, for consideration for many years, but were indeed rapidly adopted. And alongside this, we see new and emergent participatory formations that, that, uh, that, that were created in, in response to COVID-19. These huddle-like collectives augmented and built upon more formal forms of representation and, and participation. So in this sense, the paper that we, we, we've written here is, is a story of tables and huddles, an attempt to make sense of the atmospheres <laughs> that, that characterise them. And Wendy, I'm not sure how much more time I've got, but I'll, I'll, I'll speed through the next couple of slides if that's necessary. Tatiana's going to set the time, I think. Sorry. I think we have time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. So, 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 so this paper is, is um, based on a set of semi-structured interviews that were carried out in the ACT in New South Wales and Victoria throughout uh, 2020 and 2021, but importantly predated the, the latest um, Delta wave. So that's an important consideration. And across the interviews, what, what, what we heard were, were responses that characterised the idea of having a seat at the table from this other kind of figure of participation in, in these policy processes. So uh, as in the interview accounts, participants often talk about the role of the, uh, formal committees uh, when describing policy processes that surrounded pharmacotherapy treatment in the context of COVID. These committees, uh, sorry, uh, these processes included advisory committees, consumer panels, working groups formally established for some years within, within existing systems of governance and with quite specific terms of reference and, and, and forms of membership. And so in this context, the figure of the table was often used when describing events and processes. The figure of the table appeared to be lodged within a particular historical context of the drug user movement and consumer participation more generally. Participatory processes made possible the inclusion of people who use drugs in drug policy, but they also appeared to represent a standardised set of participatory practices that were seen to have delimiting effects. So in the interviews, we, you know, I won't read out these quotes, but in the interviews, we, we, we heard accounts of uh, the importance of, of consumer participation, of, of enabling uh, consumers to have a voice at the table, a seat at the table, and being at the table from the beginning. Those who represent people who use drugs in drug policy uh, were said to always have a seat at the table and to have a strong voice in existing kind of committee processes. So in this sense, the table is historically contingent it seemed to represent a formatting of consumer participation in the, in the wider drug user movement in Australia. The recent work has documented the diverse forms of participatory practice uh, deployed in contemporary, contemporary policy making has documented this relationship between the formats of public participation and the formatting of participatory publics. So what seems to be going on here is a, is a co-production of the, of the format of participation and the publics that appear in these, in these structures. And, and this is an acknowledged feature of, of deliberative participatory procedures. Participants at the table are seen to be no longer standing outside or on the table, that they're now respected, embedded, enmeshed, they're mainstream, they're active. And these are all sort of quotes uh, from our interviews. However, in the context of COVID-19, it was often noted by, by our participants that formal committees had not actually met, uh, in, particularly in the period that we were talking to them. Uh, in, in, indeed, the, indeed, what was happening is that the, the formal committees were being supplanted by these by these more emergent forms, these other sort of huddles. But nevertheless, the formal committee and the figures of the table were often talked about in interviews uh, as, as being really significant and really important. That, that 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 having a seat at the table, even in the context of this of this very dynamic sort of situation, was was seen to be really important. 
Let, let's now turn to this, this other figure, this, this notion of the huddle. So in, in early uh, March 2020, one participant, that state, one state government in particular, uh, uh, formed what it called a COVID huddle. And these huddles were initially made up of uh, government employees, but they morphed into much larger participatory sort of collectives. In interview accounts, we identified similar participatory processes in, in the other jurisdictions in, in, uh, in New South Wales, Victoria, and the ACT. Sometimes in the absence of government, although the term huddle was not used to describe these, these, these uh, collectives, uh, uh, the, 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 the kind of feel and atmosphere of, of, of a, a huddle-like activity was sort of happening in all these contexts. So, so, so the huddles emerge as a kind of accessory to the table rather than replacing them. And I'm quoting here, often the case they were seen as, quote, the same network of actors who participated in the tables. They were infection gurus and other sort of drug and alcohol staff. Uh, they, they were, in a sense, drawn from a similar kind of community. When, when describing how the rapid policy changes were implemented, there was a sort of sense of urgency and common purpose. The huddles were characterised as, as being problem focused. They were said to be kind of brainstorming and having a, a problem solving approach, a, a, a trouble, troubleshooting forum. The huddles were also, in a sense, solutions to tricky problems. So what, what I think this suggests is that the huddles, uh, people came together in a rapid way without the restrictions of more established forms of participation and deliberation in, in relation to policies that, that, that were in themselves being developed um, at, at, at that time. So in the sense that the huddles opened up different, a different participatory sort of experience uh, with different sets, sets of consequences. And as I say, de uh, declarations of being objective, um, we, we, we need to interpret kind of fairly closely. They, 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 they raise questions of what does objective mean in this context? Uh, and, and of course, objective in, in, in the context of, of, of policies around drug use are, are obviously highly contested. So what this suggests is the rapid nature of policy changes in the fast moving and adaptive forms of participation that were being enacted in, in, in response to, to COVID in this particular kind of area of health policy. The, the, the huddles did also work to silence some conversations around stigma and discrimination, which have historically been under, underscored, uh, the, the historic, historically underscored discussions of takeaway dose uh, modifications and pharmacotherapy more generally. Okay, so in the, in the moments that remain, I just wanted to think about what, what, what does this case study potentially tell us about uh, public participation, science and technology, STS, and, and the emerging uh, uh, sort of health uh, emergency of, of COVID-19. So thinking about participation, I think there are sort of three things that I wanted to just sort of um, kind of end on. So how might the impulse towards participation open up uh, notions of, our, of expertise and our capacity to sit Uncomfortably, uncomfortably with different accounts of the world? And, and how might we respond to this sense that hard won uh, uh, kind of outcomes to, to instantialize and, and institutionalize forms of participation become proceduralized, become bureaucratized? So, so how might we understand that uh, that process? And one, one thing here is I think the, lang the language and literature around, around technologies of elicitation. I mean, we might then also expand that, that, that literature to be thinking about uh, technologies of representation and technologies of deliberation. As, 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 as Chris Kelty has suggested, I'm quoting here, the power of participation at its best is to reveal ethical institution, intuitions, make sense of different and collective forms of life and produce an experience beyond that of individual opinion, interest or uh, responsibility. But in the 21st century participation is more often a formatted procedure by which autonomous individuals attempt to reach cal a calculated consensus. So reflecting on the standardization of approach and the standardization and circulation of, of very specific models of participation, I think is, a, is, a, is an opportunity for STS scholars with their interest in, in the socio-technical. The second move that I, or the second observation that I wanted to just sort of make in closing is, is, the, is the need to attend to what we call, what I've called with my colleague, Jason Chilvers, uh, ecologies of participation. So what we're not present, uh, suggesting here is that there's a, there's a kind of the table, we had the tables and then we had the huddles and they're quite separate. What we're thinking about here is the relationality between these two forms of participation. 
So our, 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 in our account, the, you know, the huddle seemingly punctuated and offered an emergent mode of participation to the established network of actors built around, around, the, around a more enduring forms of uh, formal participation. So, so, they, so they did not replace one format with the other, but it's notable that uh, participation in, in the huddles was often premised on long-term participation in, in other more formal processes. So this is, in a sense, an encouragement to, to be thinking about um, forms of participation as having ecological or, or relational dynamics between them and to be really understanding those, those dynamics in, in, in some sense. And the last thing I wanted to just sort of end on is, 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 what, is, is participation rendered visible and invisible. And here I return to Chris Keldy's observation that uh, making participation visible to, to participants is itself a necessary but insufficient condition of its success. And one of the features of, of the huddles we document in this paper is that they were, is they were sort of invisible to, to wider scrutiny. So the committees have this much more obvious form of visibility and, 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 and that's, that's sort of manifested in various institutional processes. Uh, and and what, seems to be, uh, what seems to be going on in, in, in the huddles is, is a different kind of visibility. So as we are, attune ourselves to, to questions of, of emergent and material forms of participation, I think there's a, there's a kind of analytic opportunity there to be thinking about well, what forms of visibility uh, might be appropriate to be, to be, to be kind of mobilising in documenting and analysing these, these, these formations. And returning to the problem of the session, it seems that one conclusion we might draw from our case study is the kind of visibility often taken to be the hallmark of participatory moves is not simply accomplished methodologically or procedurally, but is produced through situated assemblages of actors in participatory contexts and is therefore contingent. In, in the participatory, in, in, sorry, in the pharmacotherapy space, attention is now turning to the permanence of the changes orchestrated in the context of COVID-19. So can these more flexible arrangements survive after the, the health emergency? In the context of Kerry Chan, uh, and, and returning to her um, sort of intervention in the press conference, I think perhaps what it might mean for us is that we want to do two things at once. We want to protect the contingency, articulate the contingency of the impulse towards participation and its values, but also to see participation as a site, not, not just for methodological kind of work, but also for sort of critical and eth ethnographic sort of intervention. And that's Tadiana, that's probably enough from me. Thank you very much, Matt. I, I let it run a little bit longer because we had oh. quite a bit of time at the start. Sorry. And, um, no, that's fine. No, I, I think it was, um, it was really, um, I think it uh, complemented what we had uh, in a really, really good way and we can, we can get in, into that. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Rachel. If she's here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, if you have, um, if you want to make a few like comments, a sure. Comments and then we, yeah. I think there's so much going on that overlaps in these. And I really think, again, I want to thank Tatiana and Wendy for bringing them out. I think one of the issues, I'm not sure quite how to put this, but I have my feet in a bunch of different kinds of communities, I think, one of which is HPS, you know, with Tatiana and so on. And there, I think there's been a lot of dialogue around things like science and values, but Arguably, I think the HPS and even to a certain extent the philosophy of science community has just discovered kind of a lot of these issues about public understanding of science. And I find it interesting because often, and not Tatiana necessarily, but often there's this tendency to go back to sort of the basics of the concepts and do it in a very um, theoretical and not grounded in examples or case studies or literature kind of way, um, as though if it's been said in public understanding of science or even STS, um, it doesn't have enough theory behind it. Um, but I think the interest is there amongst those groups. Partially, as I said, it's part of the values in science. It's part of the recognition of the need to understand socially engaged science. Um, I think to a certain extent, you know, the same is true. I'm looking at this through all these lenses. You know, STS has long done a lot of work in these sorts of areas, particularly people working in public understanding of science, but not necessarily engaging with the th theoretical kind of focus on, say, deliberative approaches. Um, sometimes a, pr a 
engaging with things like um, uh, participatory action research or whatever else, depending on the case studies. But there, I think we have this, this current gap where it feels like we've been doing this a really long time in a place like STS, and yet it's still not getting out there in a way to the people who sometimes end up recreating the wheel when they're trying to do some of this very same stuff. So for me, in a way, the question is how can we, and this might be part of the project we wanna try and do, bring these groups together so there isn't this remaking of the wheel and so that best practices can be articulated and open research questions be prosecuted. And I think that's particularly important in the present moment because there is this, and I think Matt's talk brings this out, there's this kind of sense that, you know, we're losing the public. I mean, at very least, a lot of the scientists think we're losing the public, we're losing their trust. Some people might say, I wouldn't say that, that's a different story. Um, we're losing their engagement. Pache, Wendy, I actually prefer engagement a lot better, but, you know, again, it depends on how much you've had a history of dealing with those kinds of words. Um, and that there is a need to, to rethink how we do this and how we do it well but I think the tools have not been aligned well. What will we need to do to align the tools? I think we need to think really hard about what the goals are. And I think that was a good point that Adam brought up, you know, strictly deliberative approaches. You are supposed to be able to make a difference to policy. It's supposed to be a policy input because you shouldn't be promising things that you can't deliver on. But often when we're doing this for research purposes, we don't have that except in very indirect ways. Sometimes we have it in direct ways if we're doing a study for somebody who's going to make the policy, as I mentioned. Um, I think the concepts matter, the goals matter, and the way we frame the issues matter. And that almost takes us full circle back to Wendy's comments at the beginning, um, in part um, to think about, yeah, I mean, Simon, I might contest that too. I probably should have put scare quotes around the, you know, we need to be able to have a policy outcome. I think that's where, and I didn't, I didn't trash the deliberative democracy, I may, I may as well be even handed and trash everything, right? So the deliberative theorists tend to be super narrow and concerned about a lot of things that when you actually try and do these things in practice are highly problematic. And, you know, we can talk more about the epistemic agnosticism, but I also think there's this tendency to be um, policy agnostic, or sorry, policy driven where there's lots of room for deliberative style approaches that aren't going to tick every box of every part of the theory, right? And again, there's that gap. So leaving that aside, I'm wondering, you know, what people in this group who do have feet in multiple camps can think about doing, particularly in the Australian New Zealand context, where I do think we have publics who are willing to engage around issues. Um, and furthermore, there, you know, how much do we revisit, you know, remake the wheel around the concepts um, or need to think about making things in a very different sort of way. So the call for this workshop really um, brought out perhaps we are in a unique kind of, you know, I don't think wholly unique, but we have distinct issues associated with things like diversity and how we actually respect and engage with diversity given our particular cultures and their histories. And that may be quite distinct than doing this in Sweden, I don't know, throw something out, Denmark. Um, I think, you know, we often do the looking back to say the United States or to the United Kingdom, and yet Australia and New Zealand are very distinct in a lot of ways because of their histories and the way in which these things have been done. And so I do wonder, you know, we haven't really touched on it that much, but what are the distinct kind of features facing us as we think ahead to trying I mean, I do think one of our goals is trying to involve the public more in these debates, discussions, policy, and so on. Um, that is a big part of what we think is at stake here. Um, and what are the real prospects of doing that kind of in a positive sense, given that we're in this very conflicted, I hope it's just a moment, but I don't think it probably is. Um, so those are just some thoughts, kind of also trying to focus us on um, the goal of the afternoon, I think. Wendy wanted to jump in a long time ago when I said something about okay. Wendy. Yeah. No, thanks, Rachel. That's why I, I was I was just um, wanting to follow up with something with Matt, um, but I think it connects with what you said as well. So thanks for that. Um, Matt, I'm really interested. I'm thinking again about this, you know, engagement versus participation. Um, and I think for part of 
part of the distinction for me is participation does actually um, tend to focus on um, people kind of moving into these spaces. Um, and, and for me, engagement is more what happens in between people or in people kind of reaching out to each other in that space, in those spaces. And I'm, I'm often finding this, that there's talk of, you know, you just have to get people to the table and who is it you're getting to the table and what is it you're assembling, but not about what's happening there, what's happening once they're at the table. And I think well, that- It's interesting because, Wendy, I think of engagement as involving all that stuff that's happening and not just the, I mean, that's why I like engagement because it, it's engaged, right? Um, yeah. As opposed to words that are more passive, but maybe all these words have too much baggage. I'm not sure. Sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I just like to kind of hear a bit more about what's wrong with engagement. You know, whereas yeah. participation to me is just more, it's very neutral. You know, I can participate simply by voting. I can, you know, participate yeah. in very low grade ways. Engagement to me is a little bit farther up the chain of involvement. I don't know. Well, and I like, I mean, I like engagement. I'm not kind of, um, what I don't like about it is that we don't, we're not clear what it, what we don't have a shared meaning for it. You know, that's what frustrates me. And particularly we're not clear about whether it's different people engaging or different groups engaging or people engaging with technology and, you know, it's used in so many different ways. And, you know, reading a website and clicking on things is engagement these days. So, you know, that's all part of what frustrates me about it. But I'm really interested in, in this concept of what happens between us. And, and, and there I think we, the issue of practices is really important. And Rachel, I'm, I've been really pushing back for quite a while now on the idea of best practices, because I think this is a far too complex kind of environment to think about best practices. And I think that's part of the proceduralism, the proceduralization that Matt was referring to. Uh, but I think there's a lot more that we can look at in considering these spaces, which are really interesting, Matt, and, and the atmospheres, but what I'm interested in, what are the practices that go on in there? And it's really interesting for an engagement practitioner because I'm not usually the one who's actually doing the engagement. I'm setting up the space and intervening in the space so that engagement happens in there in a productive kind of way. And so, you know, Nicola and I for a while have been thinking about the idea of care as a useful way to approach these kind of practices because care is very relational. It's also very kind of, you, it's about feeling your way about responding to the particular huddle or, or table or whatever it is you're dealing with and, and moving forward towards something better, recognizing that you can't bring the better from the outside, the better has to come from, from the relationality. Um, and, I yeah, and I wouldn't disagree with that, but I mean, I guess I would say I didn't mean best practices in a really lightweight way, but what I am seeing, God, this is being tight, but I am seeing like in the United States, for example, people are just discovering the public understanding of science and they're just making things up as they go along because they don't even realize that anybody's tried any of these approaches before. You know what I mean? Yeah, so in yeah. that sense, there are some things that we know are better than others, whether they're best, you know, I just mean practices that have actually been tried and either worked or didn't in various ways, depending on your goals and your... Yeah. Yeah, that's all, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, gotcha. I mean, I, sometimes I think principles are more useful in that sense, because, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Hi, can, I, can I, I know that Colby has his hand up, but I'm just thinking it's um, almost um, 2.30 or 4.30, so I don't know if um, Matthew wants to respond to... Wendy's comments, and I don't know, Kobe, if your comments are of more, is it specific for mate or is it a broader, in which case we can take it to the second half? I don't know. It's Kobe. You're muted. Go ahead, Matt. I can put it into the next bit. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Kobe. Thanks, Tati. I mean, perhaps, perhaps we should pivot to a a broader conversation, but I mean, uh, because it's so interesting to hear these different perspectives articulated. Uh, and I think I feel like my, my, my paper is getting in the way a little bit of <laughs> what was actually a, a really interesting discussion. But um, one, one, one thing that I, I think might, might be useful here is, I mean, I, I approach these issues from, from a perspective of science and technology studies. And, and, and in some respects, I'm, I'm having an argument or a discussion with S, other STS scholars 
um, rather than in a sense having a discussion with other folks involved in policy studies or, or, or you know, it's the delivery of democracy or whatever. Um, and so the, the discussion I'm trying to have is uh, often many of us find ourselves as, as the kind of agents of democracy in science, collaborative sort of context. So many of us, and I'm, I can see many people on this call uh, in, get, get the role of doing the, the public engagement with the, you know, the, the big science-led uh, initiative. And, and that's a really curious place for many, that many of us, myself included, found ourselves. And, and, and making sense of that positionality is, is, I guess, what I'm trying to think about. And in that context, I'm, I'm, I, I think it's interesting to be thinking about how, how do we bring the kind of, kind of constructivist and to some degree ethnomethodological eth, eth, orientation of a lot of SCS work into um, the kind of context where, you know, the, the public engagement, public participation. So that, that dual role of both being coordinators of these forms of public talk but also finding modes of sort of inhabiting those spaces ethnographically and to try trying as best we can to document the putting together, the in the making, the practices, all of the sort of lab studies tradition that we're familiar with in STS, to me is, is entirely um, appropriate to be thinking about spaces of participation. Um, I guess that's one way of answering one question there, um, Wendy, and the, I guess one other observation is that my, my reading of the connection between SES and deliberative democracy kind of work, and, and perhaps Rebecca and Simon have particular responses to this, um, is that both traditions have really interesting um, responses to the problematic between formal and wider process, let's, let's, you know, shall we say, and, and the work on deliberative systems is incredibly, you know, um, uh, vibrant part of that, that literature. Um, the literature in SCS around material and ecological forms of participation, I think is a complement or is responding in some way to that problematic. And, and I think there's really interesting kind of opportunity there to be kind of comparing notes and thinking about what, what that problematic kind of looks like, because I think it is the problematic of our time, right? That, 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 as Rachel has articulated. Uh, and so, in, you know, in the context where, where we all work, that, that sense of the formal process becoming kind of a bit bogged down and, and to some degree the process, the, the, the focus of other forms of public participation, thinking Kobe, your work around the citizens jury and on the nukes issue is as a classic case in point, um, to me is, is, is the dynamic that I think is interesting to think with, right? And, and these traditions have lots of, lots of observations around that, that I think that I think are really compelling. Thank you, mate. Um... I'm just thinking we we were meant to start at um, 2:35. Our sort of second, second half of second second half of second part, and uh, Wendy was going to facilitate a kind of workshop, um, which was actually going to continue, I think, quite nicely from what was Rachel started to talk about. So what are what are what is what is special and what is different about. Um, these countries and uh, from which we are in and what makes this different and why we can't, you know, import the best practice, how we want to take it from, you know, sort of off the shelf. And, uh, and also, I think um, some of the other issues that were raised, like about the question of purpose or uh, this uh, crisis that Matthew was talking about, the kind of participation in crisis and um, what Josh raised, the kind of climate, I guess, and participation where you have the strong um, sort of non-participatory, I guess, forces falling in a different direction. So um, we could take a very, very short break if anybody needs water or tea or bathroom or whatever and uh, come back, but uh, maybe like not even five minutes. I don't know. And, and uh, what do you say? Five. five minutes. Five is probably good, yeah. And then we will, um, we will carry on as, uh, in breakout rooms and, and sort of try to map some questions. Okay, so I'll see you all in exactly five minutes. Okay.